stay here at least uh, for a while. Well, so uh, good afternoon. Uh, the conference, although I don't know how you felt, but it was pretty substantive, <laughs> this first inauguration part. And I would like to invite the speakers, the main speakers for the, for the setting the scene session to come to the to here to the table, so that we are going to start is Michaela, Keys, Diego, We have ahead of us two hours, a little bit more, because we are thankful to the um, participants in the opening presentation to have left us about 15 minutes, which is very unusual in Spain, to tell you the truth. So they've been very good with us. Uh, the, the idea of this afternoon is that uh, we will have, in a way, all the information about the challenges, we'll have information about the types of solutions that we want to see in water and energy, and also we have information about you know, what, is, what, what is required to make it happen, to, make the, to implement those solutions. And in order to implement those solutions, we need to know about the interlinkages, the dependencies between both sectors, and also we need to know a little bit about how we can improve our way of working together through partnerships. So the idea of this part of the conference is really to set the stage, to make sure that uh, we understand the problems and the solutions and how to go about solving them. And of course, uh, framing all this on the, on the World Water Day, on the initiative of the United Nations. So we can focus tomorrow and the day after more on how to implement, what kind of partnerships have been happening and how they have worked out. So I will start by asking Michela Mileto, who is the deputy coordinator of the World Water Assessment Program, uh, who is one of the programs of UN Water, who uh, is based in Italy, in Perugia, and they have been developing the new World Water Development Report, which will be launched on World Water Day. So she's giving us a primicia of what is going, uh, what is in this report. So, Michela, the floor is yours. Muchas gracias, distinguidos participantes, autoridades. Very much uh, distinguished attendees and authorities and the ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for coming and tell you good afternoon, everybody, and uh, uh, very special thanks uh, for the invite to, invite to this uh, conference and thank uh, overall Josefina Maestro, our host for this organization and uh, because of the invite to this conference. Um, Um, uh, with this uh, presentation, uh, I would like to give a contribution uh, to the discussion uh, that there will be in these days uh, um, about uh, the water and energy nexus uh, and the main topic that will be in preparation of uh, the World Water Day on the same, uh, on the same issue. Um, this uh, uh, presentation uh, uh, provide um, insights uh, of the um, upcoming uh, uh, World Water Development Report on uh, Water and Energy, and uh, also refers on information 
and the information and, uh, and the data drawn from uh, a large variety of uh, um, sources, uh, mainly focused on water and energy nexus. In fact, water and energy nexus is progressively recognized by the, uh, from the international community and, uh, um, and because uh, they are very tightly interdependent and interconnected. So the choice that one domain can do on, uh, uh, on one side can have um, impact and uh, direct or indirect consequences on the other. Um, decisions made for water use and management and for energy production can have a significant multifaceted impact on each other and this impact uh, uh, often carry a mix of both positive and negative repercussions. So we can state uh, fresh water and energy are crucial for human well-being and social socioeconomic development. But if we look at the um, global estimates of those people without access to improve the sanitation or electricity or whose rights to water is not satisfied, you will see that we are in the order of billions. The majority of the unserved population resides in the least developed countries and sub-Saharan Africa in particular. Let's take, for example, the case of sub-Saharan Africa. It is no coincidence that the figures concerning access to water, sanitation, services, and energy align so well. Probably this means that um, they are the same people that are missing out on both. So we have, uh, so we, we use a lot of water and we are still using a lot of water, notwithstanding the global estimates. Um, for example, um, it seems that in the period between 1987 and 2000, there was an increase of 1% per year of total fresh water withdrawal. And if we continue uh, business and usual, uh, there will be an increase, possibly an increase by 50, 50% 50 by 2050 of global water demand in terms of withdrawal. Um, this is not only for the uh, surface water resources, but also we are also talking about aquifers, the, our treasure, the uh, hidden resource. In fact, in, uh, there are already 20% of the world's aquifers uh, that are overexploited, and uh, currently, groundwater abstraction is increasing by 1-2% per year. Uh, that may cause, uh, most possibly, an uh, additional water stress to many areas, and also uh, this would prevent or compromise uh, the um, the um, capability of groundwater to serve as buffer for local shortages, water shortages, and for example, through the use of the uh, conjunctive management. Okay, let's look at this uh, uh, diagram, uh, which shows how water withdrawal and consumption vary for fuel production. Uh, note that the, um, the scale in the x-axis is logarithmic. So I shaded the, uh, in pink the part in which we have the highest amount of water withdrawal and consumption. So as uh, you, you see, uh, the um, water is very crucial for energy production. Um, it is used in uh, um, extractive industry to produce, to, to produce fuels like coal, oil, gas, uranium. 
and it also used for energy crops to produce uh, uh, biofuel, like fuel pellets, um, or to produce, uh, uh, to, to, to grow um, sugar cane and corn to produce ethanol. Um, the amount of water required in terms of withdrawals and consumption depend upon the different type of, uh, of fuel production as well as different extraction and refinement processes. But the question is, how much the demand for energy is growing? So according to uh, the project projection of uh, the International Energy Agency uh, until 2035, uh, we have that the global energy demand is expected to increase by one-third by 2035. Uh, if you look at the renewables here, you will see that they are jumping ahead and uh, almost doubling in 15 years. Notwithstanding this, uh, this, uh, this situation for the renewable, it seems that the relevant role for the energy, for the global energy mix is still continue to be, to rely on fossil fuels. So where does our electricity come from? So far, 80% of the world's electricity is provided by fossil fuel and uh, nuclear power with a small part of the other renewables like wind, geothermal, solar, and 16% of hydro. But the, uh, the important uh, uh, information in the project projection is that apparently the electrical power generation is expected to increase by 70% by 2035, which means a monumental implication on water. So the following question is, uh, how much water is required for electricity production? And uh, again, we have this uh, diagram similar to the other, but this is uh, uh, for water use for electricity generation by cooling technologies. And again, uh, the, um, there is a logarithm scale. It is clear that depending on the, um, on the type of cooling technology, there will be a different uh, water requirement. But the, um, the point, uh, the uh, uh, major question is mostly on, uh, on water withdrawal versus water consumption. Um, for example, is it better to use more water and consume less, or is it be better to do the contrary? Um, or maybe is it better to, to use no water, like in dry cooling, but with a highly inefficient uh, um, electricity production, and, uh, and also um, more fuel to, to be used, thus generating um, greenhouse gases and uh, possibly nuclear waste. So that is the, that are the main question. And from a water perspective, this is where the most critical decision will need to be made in terms of electricity uh, production. This is another uh, projection that goes up to 2050 uh, made by the Stanford University uh, that confirms that the relevant role of fossil fuels for the uh, 20 years ahead until one well more um, and also the, uh, the progressive expansion of the uh, new new technologies, new sustainable technologies. Um, the, 
But we have, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, to, to, things that, to think that uh, um, we can also look at the other side of the coin and uh, the other side is energy for water. So the uh, energy required uh, for water provision is uh, essentially two different types. One is pumping, for pumping, and the other is for treatment. So for pumping, um, the amount of water can vary according to several factors that are mainly uh, technical factor, um, the distance, for example, the elevation change, the depth in case of wells for, the, for, for groundwater abstractions, and other technical factors. Um, but in general, we need quite a, a lot of uh, energy because of uh, uh, the high density of water. Um, the, the amount of energy that uh, uh, we use for treatment is higher, but again, it varies according to the type of treatment, the uh, nature of the contamination, or the quality of water. And of course, the highest amount of, of energy um, are required to produce desalinization from seawater. So there is a, a big challenge, and the big challenge is about fossil fuels and uh, electricity generation. Approximately 90% of global power generation is water intensive. Thermal power generation accounts for roughly 80% of the global electricity produ production, and uh, in several developed countries, uh, this is responsible for one half of all water withdrawal. Hydroelectricity provides an additional 50%. So the evolution of the global energy mix uh, will have an unprecedented impact on water resources and other users. The decisions made today about to, how to increase energy production will determine the sustainability of the water resources uh, tomorrow. But we need to, uh, to have some optimism, and, uh, and uh, so we have potential solution, of course we have, and this potential solution may be um, they could change in long term, the global outlook, but essentially, we already have example, very relevant as example at local scale and also at regional scale. For example, hydropower. Hydropower, <clears throat> the percentage of under undeveloped technical potential for hydropower is highest in Africa followed by Asia, Australia, and Latin America. Um, however, only about two-thirds of estimated total technical potential is believed to be feasible in terms of, uh, in, in, uh, from an, an economic point of view. Um, nearly 90% of the expected increase in hydropower production in 2010-2035 would be in non-OECD countries since uh, there, there is uh, a remaining potential uh, which is higher and also the energy demand is growing very much. Other potential solutions are other kind of renewables like solar photovoltaic and wind. From water perspective, these technologies are the most sustainable sources for power generation, but they provide an intermittent service. In fact, we, we, we need to add uh, other sources to, uh, to provide energy and to balance the energy load. Uh, and these other sources could need a lot of water. 
Then there is the geothermal, and the geothermal is um, very underestimated, has been underestimated or uh, underappreciated, and is still like that. Um, so um, it is in general underdeveloped. Um, and geothermal has uh, uh, instead a, a great potential because it's climate independent, produces minimal or near zero greenhouse gas emissions, does not consume water, and its availability is infinite at human time scales. Other opportunities are um, to co-produce energy and water services and to have to work in synergy. And synergy is, in fact, the key word. Uh, sustainable solutions require a system approach of integrated solutions rather than addressing uh, the issues alone, uh, isolated, like uh, what we are doing now. And uh, uh, water and energy issues should be addressed in a holistic way because sometimes an optimal solution that we believe an optimal solution for, uh, for one domain could, have, could be catastrophic, a disaster for the other. So, um, um, what kind of synergy uh, can be, can be uh, envisaged? There are a few, a few possibilities. For example, uh, given the different uses of uh, dams, uh, hydropower sustainability can be improved through um, the integrated water and energy planning and management. Another case could be the waste heat, that there are ways to utilize waste heat and thus decrease the amount of water uh, used for cooling. And then there is waste water. Waste water is, is very promising um, and uh, is becoming recognizing, uh, recognized uh, as a potential source of uh, energy as well. M Michela, can you be closing? Yes, I'm, I'm almost finished. So, in conclusion, uh, the energy mix is constantly evolving and uh, it is al always uh, determined by national, uh, national energy po uh, policies that in turn are influenced by, by uh, uh, market, by uh, innovative technology and uh, for some extent also from social and environmental concerns. So whenever in principle, whenever we, uh, we discuss and decide uh, um, energy policies or we choose uh, te new technology, we should have a, a, a take account on the implication on water. And finally, changes to the energy mix are not occurring in the same way globally. So you can have uh, differences uh, from region to region, from country to country, and even within a country, depending on the several factors, the level of uh, development, the level of uh, availability, water availability, and so on. So to conclude, I would like to do some uh, promotion, of course, and uh, if you want uh, to have more information and uh, uh, an analysis of a possible solution, and also have a consideration, uh, look for consideration on specific sectors or regions, then you have to look at the upcoming World Water Development <coughs> Report 2014, Water and Energy, which will be launched at the World Water Day in uh, Japan, in Tokyo, on uh, the 21st of March of this year. Save the date. Thank you. Thank you. information in very little time so yes. thank you and I know it's a poor report there uh, distilled I think maybe you know what I got is that basically by those impressive numbers is that uh, 
many of the solutions for water lie in energy, and may, may, many of the solutions for energy lie in water, you know, this 90% yeah. uh, intensity in, in the types of, of energy options, no, that's very important. I have a little time for just a few questions, if you have. We are going to go through this information over and over again through the conference, I know, but you may have some questions or some issues about the data. You, I can take a couple of questions if anybody has any. Yeah, yeah. My name is Paul I'm a YASA, International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, but I'm also consulting for UNIDO and uh, SE for All. Um, I saw, uh, Michaela, you showed uh, some statistics for uh, water, I mean, water withdrawal for energy, and it was 15%. Uh, I think probably that's global, right? And maybe it's nice if we can break that down to OECD and non-OECD countries, because um, for OECD countries, this is almost equal to the amount of water now withdrawn for agriculture. So there is a near split between water for energy and water for agriculture, and I think we should emphasize that. Thank you. Thank you very much. You. Uh, no, it was uh, it was a suggestion. Um, well taken. Yeah. Any any other comments from the table, Diego, Adil? You have any? You're happy? Okay. So we are going to one. Now we know the challenges, and now we are going into the the policy and governance responses. And in order to do that. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Kathleen Dominic from the OECD. She's an environmental economist and she's been working on, on issues of, of climate change and, and now she's uh, been working on, on the, in the group that is doing much work on, on the importance of economic instruments and economic analysis in, in, in dealing with some of these issues. So Kathleen, the, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks. Thank um, buenas tardes, everyone. I'm sorry that's as far as my Spanish goes today. Um, but uh, I just want to start by thanking, of course, uh, the organizers, and in particular, Josefina uh, Maestu for the invitation. And uh, OECD is uh, very excited to be able to contribute to this very interesting agenda on uh, quite a timely topic. Uh, my talk is just going to be in two parts, basically. Um, the first is to uh, go over some water and energy scenarios, building on a, a, a bit of the introductory presentation that we've already had by Michaela, and then diving into some of the policy and governance responses. So the first part of the presentation um, takes, some, takes a look at some trends that are coming from the OECD Environmental Outlook to 2050. That was work that was launched uh, in 2012 and had looked at four main areas, climate change, biodiversity, environment, and health, and also water, and looked at uh, demand projections for water and implications for quality going forward. And then the energy scenarios that we'll talk about here come from IEA's recent work on the water and energy outlook in 2012. They had a specific chapter on water for energy. So they're two di different distinct uh, modeling exercises. Uh, but from the OECD environmental outlook, um, what we look at here is taking a baseline scenario under business as usual, under the current policies, and we think about what are the implications for the environment with a world economy that's four times larger in 2050 with over two billion additional people. Clearly, we'll need more water. Under the baseline scenario, global water demand is expected to increase 55%, primarily due to growing demand from manufacturing, thermal uh, power plants, and domestic use. This means that there will be little scope for increased use of irrigation water in most regions. Also, allocation for natural water flows or water for the environment 
uh, in rivers and lakes will also be competing with these demands and putting ecosystems under pressure. And of course, a more water constrained future will impact or can impact the reliability and, and costs in the energy sector. Of course, the climate change dimension is uh, absolutely critical. Here's um, a look in uh, projected annual changes in uh, annual temperature from 1990 to 2050. And of course, both mitigation and adaptation have important uh, impacts uh, on the water energy nexus. Of course, for mitigation, water is a critical aspect of meeting climate goals. Uh, for example, some climate change mitigation technologies in the energy sector, like carbon capture and storage, is water intensive. It requires uh, not only extra energy uh, from the power plant itself, but also water for cooling. Then you've got biofuels and bioenergy production, which relies to a large extent on agricultural feedstocks. For adaptation, uh, water and energy linkages are also quite critical. It's well recognized now that changes in the water cycle are one of the main ways in which the impacts of climate change will be felt. This includes increasing variability, increasing uh, frequency and extremes, frequency and severity of extremes, such as floods and droughts, higher ambient temperatures, including, in some cases, warmer water temperatures. Now, clearly, these have very concrete impacts, and water shortages um, and heat waves have already had detrimental, uh, very visible impacts on electricity reliability, especially in drought-prone and water-scarce areas. An example from France in 2003 was the canicule, that was the heat wave. A record heat wave um, forced EDF, the, uh, the energy company, to curtail nuclear output, equivalent to the loss of four to five uh, nuclear reactors, costing an estimated 300 million euros to import electricity. In India, more recently in 2012, a delayed monsoon uh, raised electricity demand because of increased need for pumping groundwater for irrigation and also reduced hydro generation. This contributed to blackouts affecting over 600 million people. Overall, the outlook shows that almost 40% of people in 2050, or 3.9 billion, are projected to live in areas that are severely water stressed. Now we're going to take a look at a couple of the recent IEA projections. And the World Energy Outlook is, a, of course, a distinct modeling exercise than the one I was discussing from, from the OECD. Um, but they did a very interesting analysis on water for energy in, in 2012. And as mentioned by Michaela, overall the IEA estimates that on a global scale, um, the energy sector accounts for around 50% of the world's fresh, fresh water withdrawal today. Um, cooling for power generation is the largest user of water in the energy sector, primarily coal-fired and nuclear power plants. And in the IEA's analysis, they looked at three basic policy scenarios for energy. One is under the current policy scenario, so this is business as usual. Uh, in the blue here, you see what's called, they call the new policy scenario. This is a scenario where increase in energy demand glows, grows more slowly than in the current policy scenario. You also have some policies that encourage um, renewable energies and climate change mitigation, but not enough to reach uh, global climate goals of limiting the average, the annual global temperature rise to two degrees. That's the 450 scenario, the climate change mitigation scenario that you see in green. Anyway, um, with regard to the new policy scenario, in the period 2010 to 2035, water withdrawal from energy increases by 20%, and water consumption for energy increases by 85%. So the consumption grows much more quickly than overall withdrawals. And the three main forces that they, uh, they uh, pinpoint as driving these trends is the use of more efficient power plants, an ongoing shift toward closed loop rather than open loop cooling systems and expanding biofuels production. Here we take a closer look of the new policy scenario uh, breakdown by fuel and power generation type. Um, in the new policy scenario, water used for power generation continues to account for the bulk of 
water requirements for energy production worldwide, although the need for biofuels also becomes much more significant as their production accelerates. Uh, increasing shares of gas-fired and renewable generation play a significant role in constraining additional water use in many regions as the water requirements are lower. Um, but it's interesting to note here when looking at power generation, global electricity generation is expected to grow by around 70% over the period while water withdrawal and consumption will grow more slowly. So the, um, the estimation is that uh, that won't be that won't grow as fast as global electricity generation expands? Now, here's just an interesting look um, that that illustrates uh, what I just mentioned: um, this uh, faster growth in uh, water consumption intensity. When we take a look at projected shifts in water intensity, we look at withdrawal intensity, that's on the left panel, and the consumption intensity. And this is just a breakdown across um, regions. Um, and these trends had an opposite direction. So the withdrawal intensity of global energy production actually falls by 23%, whereas consumption intensity increases by almost 18%. And as mentioned previously, this is due to um, mainly an expected shift in the power sector away from traditional uh, once through cooling systems. Of course, I've been discussing more of the quantity risk uh, that arises from the water uh, energy nexus, but of course there's a quality risk as well. I'm not going to dive into it, but I wanted to mention it here. And this is of course especially true for the production of non-conventional oil and gas, whose future viability also depends on the ability to manage uh, environmental and social concerns. Um, just quickly, I wanted to also share this uh, map, which I thought was quite interesting. The IEA analysis also does a qual qualitative analysis to pinpoint some regional stress points, and China is one of them that they look at in the chapter, the U.S. and India as well, uh, for those who are interested in having a look. Um, the point here is that there's a very important spatial dimension. There's a important temporal dimension to this discussion, but spatially as well. And China is an interesting illustration because here you see that China's water challenges are exacerbated by geographical disparity between where water is abundant and where there is high demand um, for water intensive agriculture and industry. Uh, limited water supplies and, and widespread pollution of river systems also put increasing pressure on the resource. Now to dive into um, some responses. Clearly, uh, there are a number of challenges. We could uh, go much uh, in much further detail on all of these, but to have a bit of time to share some, some policy and governance messages um, and provide a few examples that, that give some food for thought would be useful. Um, clearly, the linkages between water and energy are very strong. Um, as, as this, this uh, very conference shows, but uh, often the policy settings are quite incoherent. The options to increase water security are often energy intensive. This includes vastly increased energy requirements of certain water supply augmentation strategies like long-haul transfers and desalination. In addition, water efficiency improvements are in some case made at the expense of energy efficiency. For example, efforts to reduce water consumption at power plants can sometimes be accompanied by the trade-off of increased costs and lower power efficiency and may in some cases result in higher greenhouse gas emissions. Of course, in the same vein, as we uh, heard about already, water is a critical aspect of meeting future energy demands and climate goals. Improved coherence requires then meeting multiple policy objectives for water and energy at the same time to the extent that that's possible. Of course, that includes improving water security, increasing energy security, and mitigating and adapting to climate change. Pursuing policy objectives independently often leads to incoherence. You can have water blind energy policies that fail to take into account any water impacts or, or the, the specific water context. 
Um, and you can have energy blind water policies, uh, which might include using energy intensive options to augment supply. So what are some ways to think about improving coherence? Um, of course, there's various technological uh, options available. And many of the challenges can be met with uh, current options that are available, but they impact water and energy policy objectives in different ways. Um, they may help uh, the achievement objectives, hinder them, require trade-offs, or be rather neutral. Some of the win-win technological options for water and energy in, uh, relate to efficiency improvements, although that's not always the case, but some examples here are low flow fixtures or energy efficient appliances. And of course, there are, there are cases where trade-offs are required, for example, irrigated biofuels and groundwater pumping. In terms of strategies to enhance policy coherence, we can think about these in terms of three broad options. One is exploiting win-wins, and this is pursuing multiple policy objectives at the same time. As I mentioned, oftentimes this entails increasing water and energy efficiency. Um, the example of Singapore is a great one here because Singapore's made great efforts in water conservation. And given the high energy intensity of Singapore's water supply, water conservation also provides strong benefits in terms of reducing energy consumption. A second broad option to improve coherence includes avoiding conflicts. So trying to pursue one policy objective without necessarily uh, undermining the others. Um, an example here uh, is taken from Israel where they require solar hot water heating systems on new buildings. Or for example, there are numerous examples from the Middle East in terms of using waste heat from thermoelectric power plants to desalinate uh, seawater to provide reliable drinking water. And of course, there's managing trade-offs where negative uh, externalities or negative impacts on other policies may be inevitable but could be minimized to some extent. And one example here is in Brazil where recycling effluent from biorefineries um, can help reduce negative impacts on freshwater ecosystems of the production of biofuels. And in Israel, uh, there's the explicit coordination of policies for water allocation and energy consumption in the Israeli Water Authority's 2010 master plan. And this includes several measures for minimizing water-related demands on the national power supply, approximately 6% of the total national demand for electricity. Um, there are also options to improve incentives, uh, policy options to improve incentives and information. And one key area to think about in the water energy nexus is certainly water resources allocation. Uh, water for energy is competing with a number of other users and we actually have at OECD a current project on this very topic and we're surveying uh, OECD and BRICS countries to just get a sense of how water allocation is done. And what we've found is there's quite a big information gap here and countries approach in a very different way. There are ways of prioritizing uses and handling uh, allocation. Um, so in general, the way in which allocation is, the allocation regime is designed um, can definitely be improved in many cases to make it more efficient so water goes to higher value uses, but also flexible to, to, to adapt to changes, changing climate, changing policy objectives, and equitable in terms of sharing the risks among various users, as oftentimes we see very low priority users bearing the brunt of water scarcity or banning options when droughts occur. Another point is certainly worth uh, examining from the policy's perspective is focusing on renew, uh, removing environmentally harmful subsidies. There's a number of examples where subsidies, for example, from energy use exacerbate groundwater pumping and drive over exploitation of the resources. Um, certainly a lot of our work at OECD looks at how economic instruments can be used. Um, I see Carlos there who uh, has some interesting message on, on, on this and has participated in a, in a, in a very um, uh, deep and broad study on the use of economic instruments for water. Um, but in general, just briefly, clearly water pricing, abstraction charges, pollution charges can help to 
better reflect in some cases when they're properly designed and well implemented the economic value of water and internalize some of the negative impacts and finally to note about better data of course this is easier easy to say harder to do but uh, this this is a message worth repeating uh, data is needed on available water resources on water withdrawal and consumption a lot of the data available and some of that that was some of the data that's used for the IEA projections are, are mostly uh, based on theoretical estimates. And then data on water withdrawal and consumption by other users, including agriculture. Um, this is really important to, to better fine tune policy responses. Of course, policy requires an effective governance mechanism to fill the information gaps to engage the relevant stakeholders. And OECD is doing a lot of work on water governance as well and also on the specific top topic of stakeholder engagement. Now, of course, there's a number of governance challenges for the water and energy nexus. Um, OECD work on water governance in, in 2011 shed some light on some of these obstacles to effective coordination. And I'm just going to go through them uh, quickly here, and then I've just got one more slide and we'll wrap up. Um, <clears throat> There are multiple institutional gaps, lack of institutional incentives for cooperation, a lack of platforms or governance mechanisms to manage trade-offs. There's, of course, the interference of lobbies, um, absence of strategic planning and sequencing of decisions. There's also different timelines in terms of water policy planning and, and energy planning as well, and usually a strong asymmetry of information and resources among institutions. Uh, there's also, of course, intense competition uh, between different ministries and public agencies. Um, that said, there are some interesting responses that, uh, that uh, can hide, shed some light on countries that manage to, to put in place some, some good or some better practices uh, for joint decision making and planning. Um, I just want to share a couple of examples. One is from Brazil, and in Brazil to limit negative impacts on freshwater systems from due to water extraction for energy production, the legal framework in Brazil requires prior authorization from the National Water Agency for concessions to exploit hydropower. Of course, in Spain, we heard about some interesting examples already from the inaugural panel. Uh, the National Water Council explicitly includes representatives uh, from the energy sector, including the head of the Directorate General for Energy Policy and Mines, the Ministry of Industry, Tourism, and Commerce, as well as a representative from the Spanish Association of the Electrical Industry. In England and Wales, um, a significant portion of energy is used in water is used in abstracting, treating, distributing, and using the water to uh, produce hot water in the home. So this is a significant portion of the energy used. Um, and so the Environment Agency has singled that out and is now working with the Energy Savings Trust to develop policies in this area to reduce uh, hot water use as far as possible. And in Australia, here's an example of some researchers who are, who have uh, created the Climate Energy Water Links Project, it's called. And here the point is to explicitly add an energy dimension to water resources planning and policy. Okay, and then just to sum up, I wanted to share with you some references of um, OECD and IEA work that I drew this presentation from. It spans across the house. I work in the environment director, but we've got water work going on in governance and trade and agriculture. Um, and of course, the IEA's work I would definitely recommend. And I include a couple of contacts here at the bottom for specific topics. If you want to follow up, I'd be happy to provide introductions. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Kathleen. So many obstacles, but some light. So there's <laughs> good examples. I, I also had some, you know, questions for you because you mentioned that there was a, there will be a reduction in abstractions in the in the you know in the trends you mentioned before. You say that it will be it will increase intensity on consumption, but it will decrease uh, decrease in, in relation to abstractions. So maybe you can say what is inside the model that you know that that makes that projection you know, to happen. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, I'd like to, to open the floor.
and see if anybody has... There is a lot of information there. I'm sure not everybody agrees on some of the issues and solutions, so maybe you can have some comments as well, not only questions. Go ahead. Oh, is the OECD analysis perfect and everybody agrees? Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jose Luis Perez from the uh, irrigation sector in Spain. Talking about the uh, energy production, specifically, uh, you spoke about uh, water extraction when we produce energy. I have to say that uh, when we speak about a production of hydropower, we in Spain know about this. There is no water extraction in our case. We just use uh, the water and we give it back to the river. In Spain, we differ the consultative use of water, that is water that is uh, taken from the river, it is used. And then it does not go back to the river or it goes back to the river but very polluted. And we differ that from the use of water for clean purposes where we extract the water from the river but it goes back immediately to the river with no pollution. Uh, so in practical effects there is no water extraction. I would like to point this out um, in the case of Spain, just for your information. Adil is going to make a comment before. Thank you very much. That was a very interesting and informative presentation. Um, one point that I noticed uh, in terms of the consumptive use of uh, water, uh, biofuels had the fastest growth rate projected uh, up to 2035. Um, and in terms of the policy responses, the, the only thing that I caught was a uh, reduction of um, adverse uh, subsidies that would have impact on, on uh, water consumption. But we know that biofuels are not just a question of water consumption or impacts on water quality. Both of those are very important, but there's also an impact on food security. And, and that's a larger uh, discussion and equation. And when you talk about policies uh, for, uh, for managing that or even um, uh, projecting where we should be in terms of biofuel production, I would argue that there's a larger need for uh, for, for a bro broader uh, dialogue than just water and energy. I, I don't know if you have some, some thoughts on that already. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, Ramon. Well, only a question to, uh, about the question about the uh, electric energy. Well, in Spain, well, we published in the Potion Foundation three years ago a paper about this. The main consumptive use for hydro is hydropower because of the evaporation of the reservoirs. The evaporation of the reservoirs in Spain is equivalent to 50% of the total amount of groundwater pumped. Well, most of the reservoirs or some of the reservoirs are not only for hydropower, but Usually this has been forgotten in most of the studies that the, the evaporation of the construction of the reservoirs is important. I don't mean that it has to be cancelled at all, but the world is about 300 or 3,000 million cubic meters per year. Well, you can find it in detail in the book. Thank, thank you very much, since we are into the answers. So maybe, Kathleen, you can provide some comments on... What has been said, yeah. Okay, uh, great, thank you. Um, maybe just to start with uh, Josefina's comment about uh, asking about the withdrawal, the figures around uh, withdrawal and consumption intensity. And I should say that um, the intensity figure here is not to indicate that withdrawals actually decline, yeah, yeah. but it's the intensity um, that is the amount used per withdrawn per energy unit of energy produced. Um, 
that rate declines, but the overall withdrawals don't necessarily recline. And then for the consumption intensity, that rate increases. So what's kind of interesting here is that those go in opposite uh, trends. Um, on hydropower, I, I know that there's um, discussion around the extent to which that can be a consumptive use. And of course, that varies depending on the operation and siting of the facility and often the size of the reservoir and climactic conditions and whatnot. Uh, so I understand that that's, uh, that's an issue that requires careful attention. Um, maybe just to touch on the point raised by Adele about um, biofuels. Uh, just to add a little bit of clarity, because I went through that very quickly uh, with regard to the IEA's various energy scenarios. There was the current scenario, business as usual, and then the new policy scenario. Um, and I shared a couple of graphs from the new policy scenario. And one of the assumptions in that scenario is that there will continue to be some mandates for biofuel production. Now, um, I didn't dig into whether or not those are, those are necessarily wise policies. Um, certainly, the impact from the water perspective um, uh, depends a lot on whether those are irrigated or rain-fed, uh, to what extent they're competing with food production as well. Um, and I would totally agree with your point, actually, that this gets us into a much broader discussion than just the water and energy nexus. We can add the food nexus and, of course, the climate and also even the environment nexus. Very quickly, we get out into a broader view. So I would completely agree with that point. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Kathleen. So now we have the responses. I'm sure that during the conference we will have more examples of responses that have not uh, been presented here. And, uh, but we also heard that many of the, of the ob obstacles have to do with, with governance. No, Kathleen, I think uh, that was a, a key point of your presentation, that many of the obstacles have to do with, with uh, governance. So it is my pleasure to, to present you the, the next speaker who is Diego Rodriguez, who many of you know, who is a senior economist at the World Bank. And uh, so the, if we have to overcome some of these obstacles related to governance, obviously the first thing we need to know is what are the interlinkages and trade-offs uh, between the different sectors and, and uh, so that we have better knowledge on how we can promote them working together. So, uh, Diego, the floor is yours. Thanks, uh, Josefina, and um, a pleasure to be here as well uh, in the conference. I think it's a very important uh, topic. Some of us have been uh, involved and are uh, discussing and in meetings on this uh, issue of the, of the water and energy interlinkages now for quite some time, uh, also as part of the process of uh, formulating the World Water Development Report. And uh, one thing that I, that I can say, that, and I hope we can illustrate this in our presentation, is that we've been discussing a lot of these general numbers, the general scenarios, the general data of uh, uh, potential uses of different technologies. Um, and the, the question for us is, how do you implement this? How do you take that into practice, into investment decisions, into planning frameworks? Our clients are uh, developing countries that are investing in infrastructure, and then the, the, the issue becomes how relevant is all of this information for us in the water sector, and how can we work with the energy sector to really understand um, how these uh, data and new sources of information that we, we constantly cite now at the global level really translate at a sort of site-specific or context-specific uh, 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 cases. And what we are seeing is that uh, we are quite far from really understanding this issue. It's much more complex than what we, we know. Uh, the energy utilities and the energy sector know quite a bit, a, little, a bit about this, particularly the private sector. But when you engage with the public sector, you'll see that there is a lot of uh, holes and weaknesses and that we are basically using and extrapolating the same type of data over and over again. And on the ground, this may not be very applicable. So the idea is 
and you'll see it tomorrow in our uh, series of presentations, is to start getting much more serious into what the, these numbers mean uh, and getting into exercises in which you really use and try to determine you know, much more accurate data to, to make uh, informed uh, investment decisions and informed uh, planning frameworks. So here we, we'll be touching a little bit about some of the challenges that we're facing and the trade-offs. Uh, some generic solutions, but then we'll illustrate that th this with a particular case that we are starting uh, to do some work with, and Adrian Stone is here in the, in the audience. Tomorrow he will be presenting more of this. He's from the Energy Research Center in South Africa, and is working with the bank in, uh, in actually changing the way that uh, the planning model of South Africa is now used and, and properly incorporates the, the water the constraints and dimensions. Um, again, the, the, and the other thing is that we have to understand that these interlinkages go way beyond the water and energy sectors. I mean, we really have to engage into trying to understand economy-wide implications or implications in other sectors, and doing this in practice is not an easy exercise. So we, we already seen from, uh, from the previous presentations what are the interdependencies. We know, uh, you know each one of the, the sites of this energy needs water and water needs energy. It's very well uh, known. Uh, Mikel already touched also on the, the billions of people that have no access to energy and water and, and uh, the, the, the increasing consumption patterns and, and abstraction patterns in, in water for the energy sector. Um, of course, we have climate change that we know will be exacerbating in many regions of the world uh, the potential sort of present and future impacts. No? Um, but for us then, we have to start drilling into the regions, no? the developing countries, our clients, and there you see that uh, there are different disparities and changes. The, the electricity generation obviously will be increasing, so will be the demand uh, for water. And then you see for each one of the, our main clients in the developing countries, you know, how these scenarios look for 2050. Uh, but then for each one of the regions, we have problems that are particularly sort of spatially located. Uh, we have temporal problems, and we have also the different technology mixes and different energy generation sources in each one of the regions that we have to take into account when we look at this uh, water and energy dimension. Uh, <clears throat> well, you, you already seen over and over again, this is not something that is a, a future problem, but it's current. We are seeing, uh, you know, sort of headlines in probably every day in newspapers and journals on the, the implications of uh, droughts and extreme events and uh, uh, you know, the nuclear plant uh, shutting down, in, as, as, as uh, Kathleen mentioned. But it's also, you see more and more that it's uh, very well mainstreamed into the thinking of uh, power utilities and energy companies as well. Um, and these are some examples that were already mentioned, but uh, this is happening already. It's been happening now for many years in many areas of the, of the world. Uh, the France case is from 2003, the work from the uh, energy and water uh, network in the United States started 10 years ago, so it's nothing new, it's, uh, it's something that you know, many regions have been forecasting, but um, in many of the developing countries this is actually something that has not been uh, properly incorporated into the planning or investment uh, decisions. Um, we know that obviously the challenges will be much more complex and they've been increasing in uh, challenges with uh, increasing population growth and competition. Okay. Um, increasing uh, competition obviously from other sectors or ecosystems, increasing pollution from rivers. That is only just increasing the, the pressure that uh, other potential resource constraints uh, and energy is one of the many factors that uh, 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 is challenging the, the water resources management in the countries. And then you, say, uh, you, you, you see also a bit what, the, what Kathleen was saying, is that once you get into a country, like the case of China, we are starting a, a dialogue with the energy sector in China there for the 2016-2020 for the energy plan, 
uh, and they are very, very concerned with uh, potential fracking in the north because it's actually the driest uh, region and whether there is more competition for water, particularly from the irrigation sector. So how do we ensure that there's potential, a potential market for fracking, uh, taking into consideration not only the externalities, but also taking into account the future competing sources? Um, and that, that faces, that problem is a, is a spatial problem because it's primarily located in the north. So in many of the countries in the world, we see that within the country we have uh, disparities on how, um, how much of a, of a problem this is, depending on where you are uh, located in the country. And here we, we have to start thinking, uh, and that's something that we are doing in the bank now, that we basically rather than looking this from the water resources management perspective, we look at this as the energy sector is our client, which means brings an additional set of challenges, with, which is how do you break uh, or how do you ensure that the, the two units of analysis, which in the case of water is a basing, in the case of energy is a grid or a network, how do, how do you make them overlap? No? And, and that is quite a... Yeah. Um, so, so, the, so the challenge for us is precisely how do we ensure that uh, you know, we work with the energy sector understanding how the energy sector operates, how the energy sector talks and speaks, uses their language, what planning tools they use, and, and, and see how we shift a bit the, the way that things are being done in, the, in, the, in that sector. Um, this, this has actually results are quite interesting from the um, carbon disclosure project from the water report in 2013 in which they ask a, a series of companies around the world on, on the perceived and, uh, or actual water risks um, and water constraints in the future to a series of water utilities and, and power companies, the largest ones in the country. And you see already that, uh, you know, 82% of the energy companies and 73% of those utilities are already indicating that water is a substantive risk to business operations. And that's another thing that we from the water community, I think, uh, need to do a much better job is to probably show and demonstrate to these utilities what are the potential financial losses of not properly incorporating the water constraints in, into planning or investments. Um, we see that the, 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 are the, the needs um, of the energy sector is extremely vulnerable to these water issues. They were, we mentioned before the increases in water temperatures, that then you have the issues of, of cooling, or not, not being able to cool many of the plants due to existing regulations. Uh, this obviously applies more for developed than developing countries, where in the south we tend to ignore regulations. Uh, but it's still quite a, a problem. Uh, obviously, water availability, the, the, the quantity also affects the, uh, the extraction. We have these regulatory uncertainties in many places. If you look at China, there's no existing regulation in terms of fracking, so there are basically no controls. Um, sea level rise, obviously, will affect uh, the location of energy infrastructure. Uh, and, of course, we have the problem of water quality that impedes, in many cases, uh, generation of electricity or the use of uh, water for cooling purposes. And, obviously, again, that, that, that has a lot of impacts in the sector, including the financial losses. And, and I insist on that because this is what uh, the language that utilities may want to hear about. Uh, and the energy sectors, again, when we start with climate change, we see that uh, they're in, they will be increasingly affected and in, in different types of uh, manner. So you see energy impacts on mainly, mainly all sides of the energy uh, uh, cycle of the energy sector, from renewable energy resources to the supply, to the transport, design and operation and maintenance of the systems, the demand side and the cross sector. So when you start looking at the demand and supply equation of the energy sector and the interlinkages with water, and on top of that, you add, uh, you know, uh, vulnerability risks and, and uh, impending uh, climate change. You see that uh, understanding these planning frameworks can get extremely complex. Uh, these are interlinkages that cannot be delinked by many other means, and it's quite different, difficult to try and, and put them together. 
Um, this is again based on, on several studies that have been done uh, uh, recently on the left uh, top for you. The China study that was done by, uh, by the uh, WRI, the World Resources Institute, looking in the left uh, graph, you know, a baseline of two, uh, year 2000, and in the right is basically 2025 with climate change, and basically you see the dots there are all the power generating plants that are located in South Asia, particularly in China, that are in areas of uh, potential water scarcity. Uh, the other figure is an, a study on, on extreme events in Mexico in which you see that a lot of the vulnerability of the energy sector uh, will be from the impact of uh, typhoons and hurricanes in, coastal, uh, in the coastal regions of Mexico. And you see a lot of, uh, of infrastructure that is, has been built and is being planned in those regions. And the, and the, one, the one in the bottom is a study done in, uh, by a Norwegian university on the decrease of hydropower capacity in, uh, in the world and in many countries of the world due to climate change as well. So, so we see that, this, that the, the energy sector will be also greatly affected by, uh, by climate. And, and as we keep on saying, it's all about trade-offs. I mean, even the win-wins have trade-offs that have to be analyzed and properly incorporated in policy and different uh, economic instruments. You look at the, the issue of dry cooling versus the cost of electricity. You say, okay, fantastic, let's promote dry cooling. Well, the, the issue is that dry cooling is more expensive. Uh, there are four to five percent losses in efficiencies in the electricity system. That changes the financial equation for the utility. And the issue is, do you need to always promote dry cooling, particularly if you're, if you're in an area where water resources management is properly done, uh, pricing is, is, is there, uh, the correct policies are there, then the question is why do you need to force this type of uh, uh, responses? Um, dry cooling also increases uh, the emissions of uh, greenhouse gases per kilowatt. So you have, again, if you look at a climate uh, policy and you don't, you don't necessarily look at, uh, at the issue of uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the water side, you're having conflicting uh, policy messages. Uh, obviously, the discussion and, and that is a very heated debate on the water for energy versus water for agriculture. Again, if you look at the economic value of the unit per water, you should be generating electricity and not doing irrigation. But that's not a, a water or an energy question. It's a social policy issue. It's an issue of food security, and we have to understand those, those trade-offs. Um, and again, the issue of, of hydropower that is always uh, comes up when we discuss water and energy and it's uh, the discussions that we are trying to uh, use more and more the multipurpose facilities or the multipurpose dams. Um, and that has also tremendous uh, trade-offs, particularly when you look at uh, dams or reservoirs that could uh, mitigate some flood uh, events. Uh, rather than, than using the, the, that, uh, that capacity to generate electricity. So those traders need to be quantified when you start looking at uh, some of these potential investments. Uh, so for us, the challenge is how do we plan and we design these investments? Um, th there's obviously a tremendous political challenge, uh, and we have to be you know, very clear about one thing. The energy sector is a big brother in the room with the exception of a couple of countries, the energy sector dominates and will dominate in most of the discussions. So you might as well try to see the way that you can uh, help that sector and understand how the complexity of the intricacies of the hydrological cycle and water resources management to ensure that the investments that they, that they do or the plans that they do properly incorporate uh, the water dimensions, including the problems with climate change which will affect the supply and demand on the water side as well. Um, and the issue is also, let's concentrate on the places where we have projected or, or existing very low flows today uh, or in the future, or we have you know, projected water temperature increases, as you see in this map. In many other places of the world, this will not be a problem. So let's concentrate on the areas where this could be a, a major issue in the future. Um, and we also see that in the, in the planning and engineering process that um, were developed, they're basically developed for a different world. You know, it's very, 
I mean, with the exception of the private sector, utility private sector, that they have a lot of capacity, when you look at developing countries and governments, their planning and investments are really made very, very much at the sector level with very basic engineering. I mean, you don't see a lot of innovation, and we've been providing loans to these countries for 40 years. So, so you see and you face that problem on a daily basis. There's lack of capacity. Um, we see that even, even in water allocation, our, our understanding of the complexity of the energy sector is very basic. Because once you start learning about the energy sector, you see that it's much more complex of what we incorporate in a water resources management plan. Um, the planning process of power, sometimes they don't consider water availability. Again, the private sector may, and in many sophisticated problem, problem, uh, um, uh, models that they use, they do. But then in some cases you start looking in, and you, you start scratching the surface and you see that they use average flow mean for one year extrapolated 50 years. So there are no risks, there is no uh, extreme events, and the water is always there. So how do you start changing that uh, framework? Um, again, the construction of individual plants is very much done by what is available today and not necessarily 10 years from now, particularly if you look at uh, other competing uses in the, uh, in the future. And this obviously risks that we are locking in, in very large infrastructure and plants that are not, not necessarily the, the best or the most uh, optimal ones. We mentioned the complexities of the energy sector, and I think uh, tomorrow in our presentation we'll have more discussions on this and, and, and uh, in some of the um, presentations that we have for you. But we mentioned the thermal pollution and the effects on the ecosystem. Uh, those are never internalized when the, when the plants are made. Uh, you also have problems in cooling also in the abstraction process, not only on the release side. On the release side, you may have ecosystem changes, you know, 50, 100 kilometers downstream. Uh, nobody has really measured. There are very few, one or two studies that uh, have gotten into this, the issue of fracking that we all have uh, discussed over and over again. And obviously the, the quality versus quantity that I mentioned in cooling uh, towers, is, it's also very complex. And of course there are solutions, um, but, but again not very difficult, not very easy to implement and they are very, very context uh, specific. So if, of course we keep on saying integrated energy water planning is, is important. We're trying to push uh, much harder into that, but, but now by making the energy sector uh, aware of this to, to try and see how we can work with them to make energy water planning rather than water and energy planning in the sense of they drive the, the planning uh, effort rather than, than us from the water side. Um, it's, it's the understanding of the complex hydrological cycle when you look at the investments, uh, future investments and also planning frameworks. So let's try to modify how those energy plans are being uh, designed and formulated the integration of energy and water infrastructure, some examples are mentioned here, there's more and more of that. We have to be aware that this could be more costly, so we have to look at the financial equation when we look at this. Um, obviously, the alternative cooling systems in, in thermal power plants, there are examples, there are isolated examples of a lot of this. The issue is how you can scale up and, and how do you develop a framework where you can analyze this on a context or a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, of course, we talk about the economic value of water. Nobody pays for water. It will be difficult for this to happen. What happens if there's a water market? What happens with your energy plan? Uh, and for us, the, the enhancement in the efficiency of existing, and future, of existing systems is crucial. There's a lot of work can, that can be done on existing systems. Uh, we don't get too involved from the water side on, on trying to see how those energy systems can, be, can become more efficient. Um, and this is just an example of, of our thinking. You know, in the bank we are now starting a new initiative that is called Thirsty Energy. It will be launched actually next week in, uh, in Abu Dhabi in the, in the World Energy Co uh, Future Summit. Um, and one of the, we are starting to work with South Africa, and again, Adrian tomorrow will give you more examples, but it's precisely to do this in, in practice, is how do, how do we change the existing energy plan of, of South Africa into making sure that the, the full costs of uh, the, or sort of the marginal cost of supply of water is incorporated in the energy plan, 
and whether that changes the energy mix, uh, water constraints are incorporated, and then we will be looking at scenarios, for example, what happens if the fracking scenario in South Africa takes place or is uh, implemented? What happens if they develop all the coal that they will be developing? The fracking situation is quite interesting. Is apparently all the possibilities are in the driest basin in South Africa. Uh, so what happens with, uh, with the competing uses? So we are working, uh, we're starting that, that exercise with them, and, and we, we work on this, um, it's called a, a SATIM model that they have uh, now in South Africa for 10 or 12 years. Very sophisticated model. You see here a, a schematic of only the energy side. All the modules are components that are, have to be incorporated. And you see in the, in the left-hand side in parameters that there's a water consumption. However, when we started digging into the model, we see that there are no water constraints, there are no water, the marginal cost of supply of those, uh, uh, supply for water augmentation to satisfy these uh, energy plants was not there. So what we're trying to do is what happens when we incorporate this? So it's very much a, a practical uh, exercise. And then as I mentioned before, it's the issue of what happens when you change the technology mix uh, and, the co and you identify the other competing uses, what happens to the economy as a whole? So uh, there is a very sophisticated uh, model in South Africa, uh, on an, econ an economic model that we can probably bring this, those inputs and, and identify for each one of the scenarios who win and who loses in, uh, in, uh, in society as a whole. No? So this is also a schematic, uh, I leave it with you, of the economy-wide framework, basically and tries to understand how all of this um, partial equilibrium modeling or modeling in energy and water affects the entire economy you know, of a country. Again, this is a, a bit of the sales pitch of, the, of our new initiative that basically is trying to do that, working with the energy sectors in different countries to go through this exercise. We are starting some work in Morocco. We have discussions with the energy uh, ministry or, or, or planning office in, um, in China, in Bangladesh. Uh, but our client is the energy sector, it's not the water sector. And so we are trying to change a bit uh, the way that uh, we work with this. Uh, and I'll stop there. Okay, yeah? Diego, enough. <laughs> enough. Thank, you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I don't know how to summarize you or you know what to do for a highlight on your on your presentation. Um, I think uh, some people here were highlighting some of the issues that you mentioned. You know, I think they received us when we came into the River Basin Authority. I think they are also worried about the fracking issue. So, yes. and then, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then so that's that's one of the highlights maybe. <laughs> and um, I think. Um, it seems to me that, that what you say about the modeling issues and how the energy sector may be simplifying the way, you know, the projection of scenarios, and I think that seems to be pretty important. And uh, it looks like um, that needs to be improved, otherwise we are looking at the wrong data and maybe mm -hmm. making the wrong analysis, because obviously with the scenarios of climate change that you mentioned and, and the scenarios of, 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 of increased demand, then we need to be a little bit more careful. Mm -hmm. I think for me that, that's a very important highlight. And, and something else is that uh, you mentioned that uh, the linkages are clear. I mean, it seems that you know, the linkages, every, everything that you've been saying, the linkages between both sectors, the interdependencies are clear. Uh, it seems that the, the energy sector is very you know, dependent on water, I and mean, then it, there is a very important risk factor there. Yeah. And you mentioned that the companies do know, the governments don't know so much. So I yeah. think for me that, that may be, may, may we, I, I leave it there as, as comments from me. So any, any questions, issues? Yes. Spain was a big blurb there in that map that he put in relation to what would happen in the future. So I leave it with you. Muchas gracias. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Uh, Thank you very much for this uh, presentation that was very uh, interesting, very comprehensive. I have a question, just an information request. I don't know how to uh, qualify that. When you talk about the trade-off, you were talking about the uh, potential solutions that you offer. I would like to know what is the uh, World Bank opinion regarding uh, some instruments or tools uh, in order to apply or implement, uh, particularly in uh, hydroelect 
hydraulic uh, infrastructures and related to uh, because it has a lot of involvement uh, regarding the environment and it also has to do with every single country every single region and uh, particularly for those countries that are uh, in a case of chronic thirst and uh, what is the big dilemma between the trade-off trade-offs trade-offs and the uh, infrastructures Yeah, Adil. Yeah. Uh, I, I also noted would in, interest your point about the the sector and the private uh, uh, sector uh, in energy being aware of the issues. Uh, just as an anecdote, uh, in in Canada, about three years ago, we had a sector by sector analysis of uh, water concerns, needs, impacts, etc. And the energy sector was divided into two subsectors: <coughs> one was uh, nuclear, fossil fuel. Based and the other one was hydro based. Both energy sectors actually came back with findings, and this was the sector itself, it wasn't a government analysis, saying that uh, water issues, climate change impacts were not of concern to them. So I'm, I'm not sure to what extent, and, and Canada is not really uh, in, in the backwaters or a developing country, and if the energy sector there can have these perceptions, which in fact also was quite a bit in contrast to what we were hearing from the forestry sector, the agriculture sector, uh, the, the industrial production, uh, chemical uh, production, etc. Uh, so I, I'm not sure I fully buy the argument that perhaps the private sector is better than the, the governments, but uh, you know, in terms of understanding the overall, overall nature of trade-offs, I, I would argue that they're still significantly behind. Don't wait next two days. Just go ahead and comment on this. Thank you. Um, I'm out, which is outside being distributed to all the participants. And it reads, never miss the opportunity a good crisis provides. Now, Diego, in your presentation, you highlighted the crisis happening all over the world. Blackouts in the US, blackouts in <coughs> India, Europe, so on and so forth. OECD and International Energy Agency, in their publications, they are also talking about the, the, the problems that we will definitely face in the future if the business as usual scenario continues. In our report, in the World Water Development Report, we highlight the facts and figures and we tell the, pol the politicians, the decision makers, what will happen in the near future. We are not talking about 2100. We're talking about what is likely to happen in 2030, in 2050. So um, what does it take for the big brother to open their eyes and see that the trouble is coming, and it's coming fast? What does World Bank think about that? There you are. Um of World Bank position in question, yeah, maybe also as an expert, human. maybe not so much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big guy. And, and also you are being webcasted, so. Yeah, <laughs> I'll be fired then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Should I respond? To, yeah? Yes, please. Uh, let me start with, uh, with Adil's point, because I, th I, th I agree with you. I th I, what I said is that in some, some energy utilities, there's more sophistication, much more sophistication. I mean, but the problem is a, it's a black box. We don't know what is in their models. No? And in some cases, yeah, I think if you talk to the coal producers of the U.S., there's no problem of anything. No? They have the water, there's no climate change, there's nothing, I mean, or in China. No? Uh, but my point was directly related to the sort of the larger uh, utilities. I mean, you see the Alstom or even Avengoa. I mean, they've done a lot of, of research. But then that doesn't permeate to the, to the government side. I mean, the, the capacities there are, in our client countries is very, very basic. And so the point is, how do you move from some of that knowledge? And we also work with, a, with the private sector. I mean, in this initiative, we have sort of the major uh, utilities and the major energy companies on board because I think they also can benefit from our, what we are doing in terms of uh, policy orientation to countries, no? government, governance structures that we propose. 
So I, I no, I, I, I didn't mean to say all of them are much better, but I think some of them, I mean, a shell probably has a very sophisticated pro, uh, model, I suspect. I mean, based on when you talk to the hydrologists in shell, I mean, there seems to be quite a, a level of sophistication that you will never see in, uh, today in another country, you know, in an energy plan in any other country. I, we haven't seen it, also, at least. Um, Eduardo, on the trade-offs, yes, very much aware, and it's very problematic for the bank because we have, you know, extremely stringent safeguards. Um, so now what we are facing is problems that a lot of the countries, if you look at Africa, no, with 7% uh, hydro uh, produced, no, the, the capacity only, and uh, huge uh, effects in terms of climate change and uh, uh, floods and droughts, that there's much more um, uh, need for, for, you know, doing the storage, you know, whether it's for multipurpose or hydropower, but, uh, you know, building the storage and building those, uh, the resilience that these countries need. But we also face a lot of uh, scrutiny from the, the social and environmental safeguards. So we are investing more and more. So we have new investments in the pipeline. It has been increasing in the past five years, but it moves very slowly. Uh, particularly because we have to look at all the trade-offs. And where there are trade-offs, we have to ensure that there is compensation or some policy instrument that mitigates part of the trade-offs, uh, impacts. Uh, but the problem is that we have, we have a, lot of, a lot of issues, particularly on, on sort of the ecosystem side, for some of these large infrastructure and really understanding what is uh, the threshold or, or what is the level of, of maintenance that you have to incur and what are the costs and who pays for that cost. You know? When you have a private utility, they don't want to necessarily pay for that, so then you have to set up some subsidy scheme of some sort, uh, benefit sharing funds and all this. So the, the transaction costs are very high. So the bank is fully on board, we are financing things, but then, of course, you see other larger countries with uh, checkbooks and not a lot of safeguards that finance things a bit faster than us in the developing countries. Um, and your last point was on, uh, on, the, um, on the big brother. I, I, think it's, I think it's precisely what we're trying to do. I mean, it's, a, it's establishing a dialogue. Usually when, when you go and you talk to big brother, yeah, and we face that internally in the bank. It took us months of dialogue with our energy colleagues in the bank. It's the issue, okay, water is there, somebody will give it to me, or I'll just take it, right? Because you need to generate electricity and, and improve and promote uh, growth. Um, we get much more into the business case. You know, you do this, this uh, you know, uh, planning for the next three or five years on these technologies, and you're going to face a problem when you cite this plant in this, in this area, and you're going to have either social conflicts or financial losses of some sort, because the resource will not be there. So, so I think it's a lot of work, but you have to change the way that, that you do business from the, from the water side. I think that it's the only way that we can get into the big brother changing his mind. It's, it's a business case, it's a financial case, right? Okay. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, Keith, I think you can come now to the, to the table. Um, so, so we, we saw how, how we can have regulations. We heard about incentives. We heard about investments. We also heard just now about take it and run, no? Yeah, but, uh, but maybe we can also think about how we can work together how we can make it happen, not only with regulations and impositions, if you want, but also through partnerships, which is the whole point of this conference. And in order to, to present what is the advantages, disadvantages, and how we can improve the way we work together, um, I have the pleasure to introduce you to Keys, not sure whether I can say your name properly, Lynn Dursley. Yeah, closer. From CapNet in the UNDP. He is a senior human resources development specialist. So he is from the UNDP program on capacity development. And they've been working hard in helping us learn how to work together. So, Keith, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much. Thank you also, Josefina, for the uh, invitation and the opportunity to share our experience in, uh, in partnership development, which is uh, basically at the core of the, of the CapNet program. Um, and so to do that, I, I have to say a few words about CapNet before we get into this partnership uh, development uh, uh, part. But then to, um, to return the favor, I will try to keep it short. And, then, uh, and this is just to make you happy. Okay. Um, all right, so we'll talk a bit, a few minutes about uh, effective uh, partnerships. And uh, I use, of course, what we have been doing in the CapNet program as an example. Um, and therefore, like I said, I have to say something about uh, CapNet. We are an international, especially for the energy people, uh, I think most of the water people here in the room, they may have heard about CapNet already. Um, we are an, an international network for capacity development in uh, sustainable water management. Um, okay, this is a bit the outline of, uh, of what we're going to talk about. Um, we are, an, an, like I said, an international network for capacity development in sustainable water management. And uh, what you see here is basically the structure of, uh, of our program. Um, it is composed of, uh, of three components. Um, although we have, we have a very small secretariat sitting, um, well, actually at the moment in transition from, from Pretoria in South Africa to Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Um, a small secretariat of five people, but the, of course the, the, the impact and the outreach of the program is, as, as you see here on the, on the screen, um, we work with, um, at the moment, around 23 or 24 capacity development networks in the different regions and, and countries. Um, they are all autonomous networks. Um, they have their own specific uh, backgrounds, but the only, what we have in common is that we work in the area of capacity development and, uh, and water management. Um, because of the, the different characters of uh, of the networks, we also have a different types. We have different types of, uh, of engagement with them, uh, from the secretariat to the networks, but also in between uh, in between the networks. We stimulate a lot of interaction between our part, what we call the partner uh, the partner networks. Um, I will get a bit uh, further into detail on what this means in terms of our partnership development uh, in a minute. Um, the second component in, uh, in our structure is, uh, are the international partners, like uh, uh, UN Water and all the components of, uh, of UN Water, but many others uh, that you see here on the screen. We are an, an associated program of, uh, we used to be an associated program of GWP, when they still had a term, now we are just a partner. Um, UNESCO IC, for example, is one of our major uh, partners with whom we do a lot together. Um, and I'll also tell you a bit about how we we work with those uh, international partners, what they contribute to our program and the other way around. Um, another, um, uh, the, the third component, the last component of, of our program are the thematic uh, networks or thematic partners. These are usually global partners that, have a, that bring in, in specific topics to our, to our program that we need to address for sustainable water management. Uh, that's what I just said. We have, so we have three components and three types of, therefore also three types of uh, partnerships um, with the partner networks. These are the, uh, the associated or the affiliated uh, capacity development uh, partners in the regions. And uh, like I said, the international partners and the thematic uh, partners. Now, what do they do? What do you, how do these partners work with us and we work with them, for example? Um, from, the, from the partner networks, they... Um, uh, their main contribution to our program is the delivery of capacity development activities always in the area related to uh, sustainable water management or spe specific um, areas or topics related to sustainable water management through their, um, their member organizations. We support them uh, in uh, developing those, uh, those memberships uh, and their networks. Uh, develop their work plans and implementation of the uh, of the activities, the rolling out of the of the programs. They also um, coordinate some of the networks. Coordinate some of the programs of the global partnership. For example, our Latin American network uh, manages our virtual campus that is uh, now <coughs> being developed. The the regional network for South Asia. Um, they are coordinating our program on leadership development. 
and on um, um, some other uh, topics. Um, and so we, we try to also um, not just decentralize from the Secretariat out the, the different pro elements of the program, but also create some ownership of the global program by sharing these responsibilities with the, uh, with the different networks. Um, and the third thing, the third uh, aspect or component of this, uh, of, the, of the, the partner networks is that they contribute their uh, experience and their knowledge into capacity development materials. Um, we have developed quite some packages already on, on different aspects of uh, sustainable water management and they always are based on, on what the different partners can contribute to such a program. Like I said, we are a small secretariat, we don't have the knowledge in-house. We generate this from within the partnership with the different types of uh, partners. And there's a lot of knowledge being based or being uh, contained in the, in the different members of the partner networks in the, in the countries and the regions that we work with. The, um, likewise, the international partners, they, they have, of course, an interest to work with us to, um, to disseminate their program uh, through the, the, the partner networks and rolling out capacity development programs or disseminate messages or, or the type of activities uh, that they do. But they also, in return, contribute to our capacity development um, packages. Um, for example, we have an, a, a very good program with uh, WMO on uh, climate change, adaptation to climate change, and using sustainable water management as a tool for climate change uh, adaptation program that you have developed with, uh, with WMO and UNESCO IHE. They bring in their particular knowledge on, uh, on this subject um, to, to enhance our, our materials, our, our packages. Um, also, the, the international partners, they facilitate in rolling out those programs that we have developed uh, together um, at, the, at the global scale. So they, they facilitate basically in courses or in activities related to those uh, topics um, and they use also their partnership in the regions to, um, to, to roll it out. Then there are these uh, the global thematic uh, networks that I uh, just mentioned. They bring in specific, specific topical inputs. We have, for example, a very good uh, working relationship with the Gender and Water Alliance when it concerns uh, gender issues in uh, sustainable water management. Um, so they basically uh, contribute that aspect to, uh, to our program. We have also a uh, good uh, relationship with the um, Sustainable Sanitation Network, um, uh, Sustainable Sanitation Alliance, uh, Susanna, in the area of, uh, of, of water supply and sanitation. Um, so they bring in those, those different um, issues or topics uh, within the framework of, of our program. Um, they're also bringing their partners. They are, of course, also networks, like the other uh, partner networks and ourselves. Um, they also bring in their members and their specific <coughs> knowledge and experience on, uh, on these uh, uh, topics to enhance our program. And they use their partnership within the regions um, to roll out the programs in collaboration with those affiliated networks that our, we call them our uh, regional networks, our geographically based uh, networks. So these are the, diff the different uh, components within our global structure and what they, um, what they contribute to the program. Now we had a meeting with our partners in, um, uh, let's see, yeah, I'm trying to keep it short. We had, we had a meeting with our partners in, um, uh, in Bali recently, in, in uh, November, and we di discussed different aspects of, uh, of those partnerships. So what makes those partnerships effective? Um, what are the challenges, and uh, so how can we do the, how can we do it uh, how can we do it better, and how we, can we assess them? Now, if if they are really effective, how do we measure the uh, the, the 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 value, let's say, of uh, of those partnerships? Now, what we came up with is a list of uh, of characteristics of uh, of effective partnerships. Now, what what makes them uh, them work? Of course, you have to have your your specific interests very well defined. Um, probably we will talk about this in the coming days, you know, what are the interests of the different uh, partners here present uh, in, in the subject, but it's very important to have this uh, very well defined at, this, at these, the, the startup of, uh, of a partnership. 
also we need to know who's doing what, basically, who's doing what on the ground, um, who has been developing what kind of uh, material, in our case, capacity development uh, materials, for example, or other types of case studies or, or researches that we can use in our, in our programs. Um, it's also very important, uh, therefore, this uh, picture is to know who is at the helm of those uh, different uh, programs <coughs> and who gives the directions, for example. Um, another aspect which is uh, important is uh, trust and ownership. Uh, it only, you, know, you only build a successful partnership if there's trust between the partners and if the, uh, the ownership is very well defined. Uh, it doesn't have to be stipulated in writing, but if it's clear to all the partners that who is actually doing what and who is responsible uh, for what, and uh, that the, the partnership in, in, as a whole has uh, a feeling of ownership over the process. If it's being led by one particular partner without having ownership of elements by the other partners, it's, uh, it's uh, doomed not to be successful. Um, many partners, they insist on uh, developing MOUs uh, for specific uh, programs. We are not so keen on it. Um, it's not a necessity for us. Um, MOUs are basically uh, pieces of paper and they don't really guarantee the success of a partnership. Um, but if you do, it has to be a very clear one. Um, and, and usually we call them framework agreements rather than, uh, than MOUs, in which you identify what are the terms of, of collaboration between the different partners. What is more important, <coughs> important for us are the annual work plans that are linked to, uh, to MOUs <coughs> and, and um, that we can evaluate uh, afterwards, you know, how, to what extent we have met our, our ambitions and... Uh, and the goals we have set for a particular time period, and usually that's on an annual, on an annual basis. Also important to, um, um, to realize is that these partnerships, or networks, or whatever you, you want to call them, they're based on a, on a voluntary um, uh, basis. It's uh, people, usually, in, within organizations. Um, they do this on a voluntary basis, and therefore it has to be also uh, clear that, that there's a benefit for the organization and also for the individuals working on these, uh, on these uh, topics. But, and th so those, those benefits have to be identified as well. And this gives also some kind of a commitment to drive the partnership uh, forward. Um, within a partnership or a network, it's always important to, uh, to focus on collaboration rather than on competition. Of course, we have dip many partners. With, we have like 30 plus international partners. And they're not always the best friends. Sometimes they compete on, uh, on particular uh, subjects. But what has to be the focus of the partnership is the collaboration and what everybody gets, uh, gets out of it. Um, therefore, also the, the, the distinctions and the roles within the partnerships, the common interests between the partners have to be well defined. It has to be clear for everybody. Uh, otherwise, they will the partners will uh, eventually switch off. Um, partnerships have to be smart. Um, like, like projects or, or programs have to be smart as well. The same for, for partnerships. They have to be specific, measurable, assignable, <coughs> realistic, and time-related. Um, I mean, like I said, we have to be specific on, uh, on the objectives and the, and the goals of, um, of uh, partnership. Um, these goals have to be measurable, but they also have to be uh, aligned and, and realistic, and there has to be some kind of a time frame from, you know, like within which we try to realize the, the goals of the partnership. Um, of course, it helps if they are relevant, and, if, uh, and also if they are in innovative, demand-driven and flexible. So these are basically what, we, what came, came out of our meeting and what we thought were like clear uh, characteristics of an, of an effective uh, partnership. Of course, there are also challenges. Now, how can we improve our uh, our partnerships? Um, for most of all, most important challenge is communication. Um, you need to have a balanced two-way communication to uh, to be sh to ensure that partners are involved, are engaged, and, uh, and that they contribute to uh, to the to the partnership. This, this goes beyond the regular me email that has been sent out by the partnership coordinator or whatever. Um, there has to be really, like I said, a two-way uh, communication or, uh, to, to make this happen. 
and also you have to be sure that you that you res respond like kind of quickly. If uh, if you don't do that, it uh, no people may lose interest and it may eventually die out. Um, it's also important to be transparent, and transparency is a, is, a, is a big challenge within uh, within the partnership to make sure that we uh, that we can access and share uh, knowledge and material by um, uh, by everybody. I mean, access by everybody and share with everybody uh, who is in within the partnership. Um, some of our parties, partners find it difficult. Um, uh, they refer to the. Um, uh, we call it again the um, ownership of knowledge. This is not um... anyway. I I'll, I'll, may remember that um, some of the partners find it difficult to, to share their products with uh, with, with other partners. And um, if we don't do that, it's um, it's very it's a, it's going to be difficult within the partnership to have something going and to have material developed or program rolled out. Um, it's um, another challenge is to make sure that we evaluate not only that we have good intentions and that you know we go ahead and roll out programs, but also that we evaluate kind of regularly how well we are doing if if the partnership is really effective. There's a lot of time consumed, and so often also financial resources go into the development of, of partnerships. So we have to be sure that <coughs> that, the, that it's outcome uh, focused, that there are results, and that we can uh, can measure how effective this partnership is. Um, financial sustainability. There has to be resources allocated by the by the different uh, partners. Um, of course, some partners are more equipped to do this than uh, than others. Um, but if there's um, if there's no financial provisions for uh, for developing a partnership, it uh, it may not happen. Um, the management of the partnership has to be defined clearly. Like I said, it's, it's important to share different the responsibilities between the partners. Um, and the visibility of a partnership is, uh, is important. If we, not only the, the, the ownership of the, of the partnership by the different partners, but also they have to be able to show this <coughs> um, the, to, to the outside world, basically, or within their organization. To make sure that um, that this is um, a good thing to do, I think this is basically the last point. How do we? I'm keeping to my schedule. Um, how do we assess um, uh, partnerships? How, you know, how do we assess that they are being uh, or evaluate them that they are being effective and that they are basically producing um, uh, what they are supposed to do? Um, we think that the focus of uh, of an assessment should be on the organizational change within the within the the partnership, so within the different members of the partnership, not only within one organization or one member. Um, it is important that this the partnership leads to some organizational change within the different uh, within, within the different partners. The goals and indicators, of course, have to be very clear. Like I said, mentioned before, when you set up a, a partner, and it has to be clear what can be measured. <coughs> And what can be uh, described? The goals, of course, <coughs> they are not. Um, they are not. In goals are not indicators. So goals are not uh, described in a way that uh, um, that they can be measured. Goals are basically based on uh, on objectives. So therefore, we have to identify uh, measurable indicators to make sure that we can measure uh, the effectiveness of uh, of a partnership. Also, we think that the the, the change, we, as we say, we, we, have, we talk, I talk of the global partnership, eh, the, uh, and this came out of our, our meeting. So we, we think that change is a result of various actions shared between partners and within uh, within the partnership, and not just one single uh, action or an uh, or an activity. Um, and the impact can be could be if we, we talk about impact, we of course we have to uh, distinguish be between. Uh, the outputs, the results, and, 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 and impacts. Now, impact measurement, of course, is very difficult I, it's, because it's a longer-term process, and um, the longer the process, the more factors are involved in, in, uh, in the result or in, in the outcome. And how can you attribute uh, uh, those results to, as a, 
has an impact to, to the partnership? It's a, it's a difficult question that we are kind of struggling with, uh, but I know that many of our partners are also struggling with that, and we try to come up with, uh, with some solutions. Um, but basically, um, the impact should be a result of a long-term institutional engagement, um, and, uh, an engagement that needs to respond to various challenges over a longer period of, of time to also make sure that the, the impact, and therefore the partnership, is, uh, is sustained. Um, these are some, some guidelines, some, some topics that we look at when we assess uh, our partnerships. All right, well, in summary, the, what I just said, the um, partnerships, they, 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 of course, are opportunities, and, but also uh, many challenges. Um, what makes it strong, but makes it outstanding, and rather than do it individually, is that we can build on the different strength of, uh, of partners and therefore enhance uh, knowledge and, and, and the outreach of, in our case, the outreach of our program. Transparency is key, sharing is of responsibility as well, as what I mentioned several times. And we have to be sure that, uh, that this is assessed regularly, that we are relevant, and that, uh, that there are the results of, uh, of this partnership. Okay. This is an, um, an old African proverb, <coughs> I was told. We, we changed it a bit. The, the real one goes, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. We say, if you want to go far, get a partner. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. So in case there is some technology, some methodology about this of working together. So it's not only a question of knowing what we have to do, but it's also there is some rules to the game about working together. Um, I would rather say methodology and guidelines rather than technology and rules. Yeah, good. <laughs> So maybe, can you, can you go back to, to the ones, you know, to, to a slide, I think it's three or four behind. The other one, the next, uh, yeah, okay, here. I, I was just wondering, using this framework, you know, a little bit of what, you know, Diego, Michaela, and, and uh, Catherine had been telling us. You know, it, it seems that we know about the interests, we know what is happening, we know why should be the energy and the water sector should be interested. Mm -hmm. um, we know who does what, you know, more or less. The trust. Do they have, these the two sectors trust each other? I don't know, Diego, maybe you can answer that. You've been in contact with them. <laughs> uh, we need to develop clear work plans. I mean, I think, I think all, the, all the story that Kathleen and Diego and Michaela is telling us that this is not happening. And uh, commitment. Uh, we have talked about, you know, ways of getting commitment through incentives, uh, financial rewards. So there's been a little bit of conversation there about making sure that that commitment comes about through, through those. The issue of competition versus collaboration. You said that we have to move to collaboration and less competition. That seems difficult for what is being discussed here. And in terms of measuring results, very difficult because we don't even have the accounts properly done, no, Diego, so that's something there. Anyway, that was sort of more or less if we were trying to analyze, just to give a little bit of highlights, how our discussions before fit this framework, it seems that even just the preconditions, just that simple list, we need to really be working at it a little bit better. Anyway, that, that's my, the way I have relate, I'm relating what we have been discussing with, with these partnerships, sort of recommendations we have here. And uh, again, the, the floor is open to you, and, and also maybe you can also comment on my comments, uh, Diego, Catherine, and Michela. So, but I, I'll leave it to you first. Yes, Sawyer. Thank you, uh, Josephina. And, uh, and also thank uh, those presenters. The, your presentation this afternoon is uh, very interesting, informative. I, I understand that you know, Josephina's summary so far. We come from the global scale, look at the crisis, look at the linkage. Then, you know, World Bank you know, uh, presenter mentioned how we look at the region specific, country specific. Now we zoom into the partnership. I have an expectation we can come gradually down to the earth down to the earth and also really like the rubber to hit the heat, hit the road. But what I'm missing so far discussion is about uh, some kind of the, how is the practical issue. Like uh, when we talk uh, Nexus, 
how we define this nexus. What is the data? You know, where they got those data? You know, so far we used energy data, a lot of the from IEA report, and the World Bank has their own data. But how, when we measure the you know, nexus, water energy, what is the data? What is the method, you know, like a criteria? So, you know, we look at the, the water, you know, for, with the energy, there is the per, cap, per kilowatt or megawatt per ton. This is the input, output. All the input is the energy or water with the GDP. Or we look at the whole life cycle, look at the, either the material flow or water footprinting. What is this kind of the, in the methodology? Because you mentioned, you know, the partnership produced a lot of material. Have the dialogue. When we have a dialogue, we should have the common language. This kind of the methodology is a is a is our common language. So, if you know, either from UNDP a colleague or bank or OECD, you can elaborate, shed you know, some light on this. Where to get the data? How to measure that? This methodology, I think that will be very useful to put our discussion in more concrete uh, direction. Thank you. Thank you, Soji. I think Alice here, she has a question. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Um, when I think of partnerships, it's about a shared interest and a common goal, a common objective. Um, now here in, in, the, in the energy and water nexus, it's about sustainability, isn't it? So much as I appreciate the way you analyzed it, Josefina, I feel that, that the real objective and the shared interest that determines who the partners have to be. Maybe it's not only the water sector and the energy sector, but a, a partnership for sustainability has more. Um, actors in the field and I think that uh, when you ask the industry you get an industrial solution if you ask the policy makers you get a policy solution if you ask the bank they maybe have a financial solution I don't know that but um, what I missed thus far is who are really the, the partners that you need on the table to make it sustainable way into the future what are the different roles this has been mentioned here that you need to clearly define roles and what is the appropriate level of intervention? I keep stressing that it's, uh, I get the tendency, of, uh, the, the feeling that we always have the tendency to start globally and then work our way down. But from what I hear now and the, and the importance of um, an integrated approach, the level might well not be the global level. It might be very local. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, so would you like to make some comments, Keith? Or, or can, uh, ah, okay, okay, one sec. Yeah, yeah please, please. Thanks very much um, for the presentation and for the panel. Um, I have, I'm wondering, because it, it, it's really interesting that you have point, painted um, the energy sector as the more powerful big brother in this uh, nexus, and obviously we're looking to, to, for ways to, um, uh, for the energy sector to be more aware of the water challenges. And the other aspect is, is that water is so fundamental for all forms of development, whether it's you know, and for our livelihood and you know, existence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if it warrants that the issue needs to be framed not just on the partnership level, but also having an overarching goal, as in the Millennium Development Goal, on the same level um, to say for all the water, you know, water is going to be clearly a constraint, not just for not just for the energy sector development, but for all the other sectors. We, 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 it seems like it warrants um, um, that type of like really big overarching in order to, for, for that action and for that vision to filter down to, the, to all levels of, of government and planning. Because and, um, at the moment, in our observations on the field, it's really not happening. It's not just awareness. It's, even though they know that it, it, it's... Um, Squeezed, uh, squeezing other water users, the energy sector is not really responding to the, or not feeling responsible for, um, uh, for, for changing. Um, and, 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 and in the energy uh, sector, there are choices. Um, that's, I think that's a really interesting aspect of, of uh, water use. Yeah. 
Thank you. Okay. You want to make some Can comments? I react to the last point? Uh, uh, easily. <clears throat> Being a UNDP program, of course, we have been guided by the MDGs for, for many years now. Um, and uh, through our, our global uh, program, uh, with the different uh, networks and the partners on the ground, um, we have been, uh, we have been um, if I may say so, we have been instrumental in, in, in bringing these MDGs further at, the, at, the, at those specific uh, levels. And it has been very helpful to us, but also to our partners, uh, let's say, on the ground. To an extent that these, these same partners are now participating in the development of an, of an SDG on, uh, on water. We, we still don't know which direction it's going to go. I mean, we have some ideas. But at least they are participating in the process of having an SDG developed for, uh, for water. And I guess it, the same could, uh, could, could be um, uh, for, the, for the energy sector. I'm, I'm not aware of what is happening in the energy sector, so maybe one of the partners could, uh, could say something uh, about that. Um, shall I continue? Or, uh, yeah? um, <clears throat> talking of partnerships on the ground, Alice and, and, and our UNEP colleagues' um, uh, uh, comments. Uh, again, I could share my, our experience, of course, um, um, uh, through our global network, how we, um, we basically how we try to be relevant on the ground and, uh, and how we're being fed uh, from bottom up rather than top down, what you, uh, what you mentioned, is, that is in the type of, um, <coughs> sorry, of um, materials and packages and programs that we, that we are developing and that are being carried by the different partners uh, who are also responsible for rolling it out uh, on the ground. So in that sense, we like to we try to be uh, be relevant for what is happening on the ground, and we, through our contact with the part with the partner networks and their members, we um, we try to respond to those uh, demands on the ground. On your uh, uh, your your comment, um, um, there were a lot, but I picked up uh, one on on commitments and, and partnerships. Um, it's much easier if for partners to get engaged and committed if the, 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 the objectives and the benefits, especially of a partnership, are, are, are clarified. Not just come together and say, oh, yeah, let's become a partner and let's see if we can do something together. Um, that often doesn't work uh, so well. There has to be clear benefits and, uh, and objectives to a partnership. Thank you. A anybody else from the table would like to make any further comments? You are happy? Yes. Okay. So I think we managed to to use all the time that we had spared from the opening and we are about 20 minutes late. So that's for your information. That maybe says about something about our cha my chairmanship. But, but I think also it was important. I think this is really being very helpful to warm up, I think, for the, for the next two days. So Adil, we are all here for you. Uh, we are preparing for World War Today. And, uh, so for, to make a presentation on, on what are the organization of World War Today and how, what would they expect us to do for them, we have, I have the pleasure to introduce my colleague Safar Adil for, as the director of the United Nations University Institute for Water, Environment and Health. So Adil, the floor Thank you very is much, yours. Josefina. It's a pleasure being back in this lovely city. I think I've been here so many times, I'm seriously thinking about renting an apartment. Uh, anyway, it's, it's great to be back here. It's a very interesting conference and very timely and on a topic which I think is gaining a lot more interest uh, in the policy and government circles. It also fits in quite nicely, as you mentioned, uh, to the World Water Day. And this is the purpose of my presentation, is to talk about uh, how the, the issues and discussions which are underlying the World Water Day have unfolded in the recent years, uh, where we are, what issues are going to be discussed in the, in the event itself, and how does this con conference contribute to, to those discussions and, and dialogues. Just as a footnote, I will not be describing the, the event itself today. Uh, and if you allow me a little bit of commercial, uh, tomorrow during lunchtime there is a side event on the World Water Day we, where we will describe in a bit more detail in terms of what is being organized and how we are going about engaging with various uh, 
uh, institutions and partners in uh, presenting their, their work uh, at the World Water Day. So let's look at the, uh, the discussion on this issue of water and energy uh, linkage. Although the topic has been around for quite some time, uh, in my view, the, the dialogue really started in earnest uh, around this water food energy nexus uh, initiative that was started by the German government about four years ago. And I had the privilege to be on the steering committee together with uh, Diego. Uh, and, and the discussions were, were quite interesting, uh, even starting from the concept of what really is in the nexus and what is not. And, and we realized that there's a number of dimensions, but for the sake of convenience and expediency, we said it's a triangle between water, food, and energy. And, and we said if you look at this triangle, if you pull on one of the apexes, the other two are going to be impacted. And I think that's perhaps the simplest description of, uh, of the nexus that, that I've seen. And what that means is that now we're focusing on two of the apexes of that triangle, and ignoring again for the sake of expedience the, the third one. Nonetheless, the messages that came out from the, uh, this Bonn Nexus Conference, as it is called in, in 2011, are equally applicable to the water energy nexus. And I am just very briefly going to summarize. My, my task is actually quite easy because the presentations before me have talked about in great detail the, uh, the, the information and the data and the various uh, sources of, uh, of that information. Uh, so I, I don't need to get into that uh, in too much detail. The first one, and the obvious one, was that there is a need for increased uh, policy coherence in, around the nexus. And there was also the, the understanding that that, in a, uh, in a practical sense, is, is actually very difficult to achieve. We already saw uh, in the preparatory meetings of, of that Bonn forum that even within Germany various ministries weren't really seeing eyeball to eyeball in terms of what this nexus means. And many would say that, you know, we are driven by our own budget and unless you tie the budgets together we're not going to really pay any attention to what the nexus means because our mandate is to, uh, to, to expand our own budgets. So the underlying concept that came out from the conference was that you have to link the nexus to various development pathways. And, and that's a way of uh, rethinking and reshifting how the various components of the, of the government, meaning the ministries, and the various policy components actually start to link together. The second message was that we need to accelerate access uh, in terms of providing linked access, and, and in that case, of course, food was also part of the equation. But the, the point was to look at what we call the bottom billion. And these are, as you saw, I think, in the first presentation by Michaela, that there are essentially the same people who are without access to energy, without access to sanitation, without access to water. And the consequences for them in terms of development and well-being uh, outcomes are really quite severe. So if you are to uh, use the nexus as a, as a development angle, then you have to provide a particular focus on, on this bottom billion and accelerate access uh, to those. The third message was that you have to think about creating more with less. Uh, and the first half of that equation we've heard now in the presentations and not so much about the second one. The, the first one is obviously to increase productivity, to produce more kilowatts uh, per drop of water, uh, and also the same applies to more nutrition, more uh, calories per drop of water. But there's also a second part of that equation that you have to think about reducing losses uh, in terms of both losses in the, in the, in the water system and uh, water-related losses in the energy system. The fourth message was that you have to really think about valuing natural infrastructure in a little bit better and use the ecosystem components to conserve uh, both energy and, and, uh, and water. And finally, uh, consumers play a very significant role in influencing policies. And again, this is not something that we've heard so far in the discussions, and hopefully in the next couple of days we'll, we'll hear a lot more about it. 
that at the end of the day, the consumption patterns are going to determine how much emphasis there is on this, uh, on this nexus. <clears throat> and eventually they also drive the politics and the policies uh, of, of how you go about implementing uh, your, your overall uh, nexus. And then there were three underlying conditions that were identified in the, in the nexus forum that you have to actually uh, have these in place in order to achieve any success with implementation of the nexus. The first one was that you obviously need to have incentives. These may be financial incentives in, in many cases or economic incentives, but there are other types of incentives also uh, which can come through uh, both uh, market-driven incentives and also uh, from the policy domain uh, through regulation perhaps. The second uh, element is institutions, and you also need to have institutional frameworks in which uh, this uh, uh, integration takes place. And finally, information, flow of information and transparency are also key elements. There was a very interesting conference we've just had uh, two months ago, a follow-up forum in Berlin on this nexus, and it was quite interesting to see that there is significant progress made on, along this uh, nexus. Uh, but at the same time, we also have exposed quite a few challenges in, in, uh, in its implementation. So it hasn't been really all success stories in a relatively short two-year period. We also had a specific uh, session, a seminar at the World Water Forum uh, last September. And the idea was, again, to start to f flesh out some of the issues that would uh, be of interest in the World Water Day. So it was specifically targeted uh, in that sense. And I'm quite pleased Josefina was uh, on the panel, as was John Payne, who was who's sitting in the back here. Uh, and there's a couple of other panelists who will be joining us for this conference. So there is a continuity of this discussion. So again, I'm trying to summarize three hours of discussions that we had in, in about uh, three minutes uh, and to share with you some of the conclusions as well as some of the questions that were uh, flagged. The first and the obvious one was that there are, there's a need for reconciling the asymmetries between the water and energy. And, and we've heard uh, so far about the asymmetries in the, in the magnitude or the, or the overall size of the, of the two sectors. We've heard about the asymmetries in the relative power that is yielded by various ministries. Uh, what we haven't heard so much about is the pricing, uh, where for water uh, sector, the pricing is driven fairly locally. And we've had also some very heated discussions about water pricing, and it's a very, uh, uh, it, it's an issue that uh, uh, elicits a very emotional debate oftentimes. Whereas the energy uh, sector has its pricing driven uh, at, at the global scale, and, and the market is quite global in, in its nature. So again, we have to somehow reconcile with these various uh, asymmetries. Another one that was mentioned earlier was that of the, uh, the, the timescales on, on which these, uh, the, the planning for these two domains works. Secondly, I already mentioned uh, the, the issue that was uh, discussed in the, in the Nexus conference also, was that we need to improve joint access. And, and this is an issue from the recipient standpoint for those bottom billion or, or others in, in the developing countries. You don't want to go to them piecemeal and say, now today we're going to give you your energy solution. Three years later you go back and say, now we're going to give you your water solution and your sanitation solution, by the way, is coming another five years down the road. That's, a, that's not a very effective way to, to go. And we know that there are off-the-shelf solutions that can provide this joint access. We had some very interesting discussion around urban development and how we need to rethink urban development so that this uh, water energy nexus is uh, essentially uh, delivered on uh, in, a, in a consolidated way. And, and that actually ties also to uh, the notion of looking at the future of energy development and to making it quote unquote water smart and, and again we've heard a number of uh, points made particularly uh, in, uh, in the presentation made by uh, uh, Diego and by Kathleen. 
And finally, um, there was a very interesting discussion about what the mutual risks are. What risk does water sector, if I may, or, or domain, uh, uh, carry if there are uh, breakdowns in the energy domain? And vice versa, what are the risks uh, which the energy domain is, or the sector is uh, carrying by not addressing and not really fully incorporating uh, the, 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 you know, the water side of the equation. And again, we've heard some very good description on, on this, uh, uh, this topic. And that brings us to setting up the context for the World Water Day itself. And here's a uh, sort of a short list of issues that we think are going to be uh, of main importance in, in terms of the discussions that will take place during the World Water Day. And the first one is how do you incorporate the water energy nexus within the post-2015 development agenda? And as we are uh, developing these SDGs, of course, UN Water is leading some of the very interesting dialogue on, on water, and UN Energy is uh, simultaneously leading uh, a dialogue on, on energy. But the question is, how do you interlink them, and are there targets under the energy goal that relates to water, and are there targets under the water goal that relate to energy? And so far, uh, of the latter, I can say that we haven't quite managed to embed any energy uh, targets inside of the, uh, of the water SDG uh, formulations. But that would be a very interesting debate, and we think that uh, the number of heads of UN uh, system who will be there, some ministers, etc., can actually uh, carry on a very interesting discussion on, on how this, this is developing. Secondly, to focus on policies on integrated management as well as governance of water and energy. And again, as, as we have already heard, uh, that's easier said than done. And we're hoping that uh, the, the discussions at the World Water Day will um, serve as a stepping stone to move this dialogue forward. Thirdly, we hope to be uh, able to make the business case for what this water and energy nexus should be. And again, we heard just a little bit uh, that at the end of the day, you have to convince those who are particularly in the private sector and perhaps those even in the, in the public or the government domain to pay attention to why this, this nexus should be linked together. And again, I don't think we've, we've quite managed to achieve that, meaning a dollars and cents uh, analysis of what are the costs for not addressing this uh, this nexus. So again, we hope to have a very fruitful discussion on that. The fourth area is to uh, discuss how do you go about creating a, a an enabling environment? How do you bring together the, the public-private uh, partnerships? And this is where this conference is quite important. Uh, similarly, uh, the issue of pricing and how do you tie that pricing. Uh, at the moment, as I said, even for water pricing, it's very difficult and sometimes controversial to discuss on its own. I think you're talking about a level up when you talk about uh, linked pricing of water and energy. The fifth area is improving joint access. And again, I've talked about this uh, earlier. Uh, but the interesting bit that we hope to focus on is the distinction between urban versus rural. Uh, and in rural development, uh, your challenges are very different uh, from what you see in, in the urban sector. And finally, looking at the long-term sustainability of water energy systems. How do you go about actually achieving that? Uh, and buried underneath this are a whole host of other uh, issues in terms of population growth, uh, food security issues, uh, climate change and its impacts on both energy consumption and, and water availability. Okay, I'm almost done. So this is kind of the, the range of issues that will be discussed at the World Water Day. The event itself uh, will be held in Tokyo. And again, like I said, uh, there will be more discussion on this specifically um, tomorrow. Let me just uh, share with you some thoughts of what we see we can take from uh, this conference and bring it forward. Of course, the 
uh, partnership success stories or even failure stories I think will be important so these case studies can be brought forward and, and highlighted uh, at the event. There's going to be a significant emphasis on the application of technology, research and innovation in the context of, uh, uh, of water energy nexus and I'll be very carefully taking notes uh, during the next couple of days to see which uh, examples can we take forward, highlight, etc. Thirdly, in terms of the sustainability, again, it's a, it's a broader discussion and I'm hoping that there will be some useful elements that we can take forward. And finally, in terms of uh, creating enabling environment, what are the incentives, uh, funding mechanism, policy uh, examples, and already we've heard actually quite a bit of uh, interesting inputs uh, this afternoon that, that we can take forward. And there's actually a fifth element that I intentionally didn't uh, put down. I'm hoping that we'll be able to identify individuals and organizations that are interested in participating in the World Water Day uh, events. And, and uh, again, I'll be uh, quite open to any, any suggestions or ideas. So I stop here and I pass it back to you, Josefina. Thank you. Thank you, Adil. Adil, if you allow me, I will not take questions for you because we are going to have a whole side event tomorrow talking about it. And I, since we are a little late, I'm going to do my, you know, the last presentation today. So you may think we have finished the conference because uh, we already been so through so much information, but um, I'm afraid we're only starting. You know, we know all the challenges, we know the solutions, we know how to make it happen. So the question here is that uh, this is only preparatory for the next two days. So Adil help us to. To, to know where we are. I think it's always important in these conferences that to know that we are part of a process. So we are not, that there, this makes sense within a bigger context. So we are not just yet one more conference in which we are presenting the same. So we are really thinking about that this, this is part of a, a process of moving a, in our knowledge and in our initiatives. So as, as Adil has mentioned, we are coming from the Bonn Conference, really. That, that's where we all started with the Water and Energy Nexus. There is, if, if many of you who are part of this international world, we do see, all of us, there is a stronger focus on this than there was before. And there have been many Nexus initiatives going on around the world. So it's not only about the conference itself and what happened there, but there is many people uh, having taken initiatives, some of them funded by the, by the German government, but, but many of them not done, so it's been taken on very much. And I think what, what we have gained from that process, you know, what, you know as a society, as a you know, international uh, community, I think is that we have improved our understanding, I do think so, uh, on the scenarios, you know, on unrelated uh, interlinkages, how is climate affecting all this, the water and energy nexus, you know, we, we saw before how, you know, hydroelectricity production potential will decrease substantively, so I think we, we need to, to see that. We also have better knowledge of how the challenges are interrelated, and we also see how, we also have knowledge about what the integrated solutions are. And there are many examples at all scales. Some people were talking here about, you know, coming down to earth, bringing, bringing some solutions down. And we also know that, that sometimes, you know, um, these are not always happening. That sometimes we, we go the wrong way. We increase uh, water efficiency by, by increasing energy use, and that's not always very helpful. And I think some of my colleagues here from the irrigation community will give us some examples on how it could be otherwise. So we also have a better understanding of the interlinkages. I think we heard about it very well. And the many opportunities for the co-benefits. 
eh? and so to try not to solve one problem at the expense of others. So what I'm trying to do with you with this presentation, I'm going through the storyline of this, of this conference, you know, all this we have heard today. And so we also saw that, that moving on, we heard about this too, we need innovations, and we, we'll hear more about innovations in the session that, that is convened by the World Water Assessment Program. We need policy responses that can facilitate this. So we also heard about what you said, uh, Catherine, about financing incentives, allocation systems. And we also heard from the World Bank about the need to scale up at all levels. So we do have some examples here. And you know, during the next two days, you will see how this collaboration is happening, what are the opportunities, what are the failures. But at the same time, we know that maybe it's just too bitty. We really need to scale all this up. And that's also a main challenge. And of course, you know, implementing all these ideas, how to do it and how to make it better. So that's also the implementation challenge. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I think I got it wrong somehow. Um, so all this is necessary to, for achieving, and we heard from, from Adil that maybe we haven't focused enough on the access issues, I'm, I'm basically for the bottom billion, and I think that's still important. So the access to water and energy, where in many countries, if there is no energy, there is no access to water. And the energy as a limiting factor for, for water supply services, I think you were mentioning that too. The need for improving water and energy efficiency, many of what we will be being presented tomorrow in the afternoon in the UNEP and the UNIDO sessions is about how we can improve water efficiency mainly in the industrial sector, but also in the energy, not only in the water users but, and energy users, but also in the energy producer side. And, and of course for ensuring sustainable development, and Alice, you were mentioning that we shouldn't forget about that, so hopefully we haven't. Um, there are some initiatives in the UN, so the UN hopefully is doing the job, what can I say? Uh, we have UN Energy, we have the UN World Water Day, we have the Sustainable Energy for All Initiative. My colleague from, from you know, the EES is here, who is going to participate very actively. We have the Decade of Sustainable Energy for All, so we have another decade. It's not only the Water Decade, now we have an Energy Decade, which is just starting in 2014. And we have, of course, the, the International Decade for Action for Water, which is the, the program that I, I am the director of. And we have good examples from, from the United Nations, from UNIDO, from UNEP, and also the World Bank Thirsty Energy, who you would hear tomorrow. So here in the conference, we are focusing on implementing the Nexus through partnerships. So we heard that there is Nexus solutions cannot be implemented by one, organization that we really need to collaborate and to work together and uh, we need to to support each other finding effective solutions and uh, partnerships are really means to an end for integrating policies that we will try to make sure that so it's not only about to know what we have to do but also how we have to do it to improve water and energy governance. So we heard that there is not enough coordination, so we need to make it happen, and, and a lot of it will have to happen on a voluntary basis, to reach agreement, to learn from each other, to identify opportunities, and to implement these famous win-win solutions that we've been hearing here all the time, these co-benefits, okay? So in order to do that, we need to, to build on partnerships. So everybody will wonder, why are we here? So we are here to evaluate the existing experience, provide a platform so you all talk to each other. So as important as the conference itself and us making your presentations and, and debates is also the idea that you will collaborate. There is a variety of participants and that's part of the richness of what we are doing. We are learning from experience, so from, even if it is a very bitty experience, it's still something that we need to build on. That's what we have and to enable cooperation and hopefully get you together to, to do some, you know, to make this partnership uh, world to be more dense and have more partnerships happening. So who, who are we here? So we are more than 120 people 
and we have to limit the, the space because we don't have a lot of space here and there is more people coming so let's hope we don't explode out of the of the room there is about 23 energy professionals and, and that's quite an achievement for the water community because we, we don't tend to be able to reach out so much so thank you very much to all of you from the energy community for being here we have some representatives from agriculture mainly from here from the from the region we have some representatives from industry from government we have nine UN agencies represented we have our UN water partners uh, thank you very much to women for water partnerships Aquafed and the World Council for Civil Engineers also very welcome to the UN family uh, we have environmental representatives, we have companies, I won't go through the list, university, many university people, many more than we had before, so that tells us about the interest of, for the research community and for the uh, innovation and technology um, advances, I think that's, that's important. And, and we also have some media representatives who, by the way, will be interviewing you and will be making sure that we are not only here among ourselves, but we also tell the world. And we have a responsibility with, for everybody out there, and we are partly doing that by having this webcasted, but also, you know, telling that throughout the other media. We are reaching out through a network of journalists in Africa. We are re reaching out through a network of journalists in Latin America. And so that's, that's pretty proactively, and of course, everybody else who might be interested. So, what are we doing? We will be looking, so this is more or less the kind of... Um, Partnerships we will be looking at. We will be looking at, at the stakeholders, so the private and the research community, linking up with governments for, for making the, the case for the business case, as, as the World Bank was putting it, for planning and investments. Um, we have some examples, for example, from, from Avengoa on how, to, how they have managed to do through these partnerships to improve water from ref refrigeration. Uh, we will have panepsis from industries and other actors to improve efficiency. So, for example, we have British Petroleum here. I don't know who it is, maybe. Okay, very welcome to. So we will talk about, this is very simple, I'm sure, but it's just to give a, a flavor of what is going to be presented in the next few days about the importance of water accounting. You know, you have a project with universities, so very important that, you know, that an energy company is doing this. We will have the water and energy utilities for improving water and energy efficiency and management. And, you know, one example will be from Madrid, but we have other interesting examples from Morocco. And, and from, we have from Veolia, no, let's go. Yeah. And then we will have local authorities for improving household efficiency and for providing access to basic services of water and sanitation and how the local authorities are linking out to other communities. So. Uh, we have, for example, a case on pro-poor public-private partnerships in Asia. I think uh, Hong Peng Liu is here. Uh, very welcome, too. Uh, and finally, we will have uh, uh, partnerships for policy research and innovation for improved understanding of the nexus and technological innovation. And we will have two panels, one from the, by the United Nations University, uh, led by Adil, and one by the World Water Assessment Program, who is... Uh, going to be led by Engin. So one example there will be geothermal into energy planning in Italy. So that's more or less give you a flavor of the kind of things we will be doing. So the structure of the conference basically is today we are setting the stage and uh, is uh, differently organized than it will be the next two days. And uh, the next two days we'll be, be talking about all these issues, all the technology solutions, we'll be talking about the management solutions, we will be talking about the allocation issues, but we'll be talking it through looking at how people have been collaborating together, the different types of partners. And we will have some side events on World Water Day, on World Water Week. I don't know whether, yes, hello, very welcome. Uh, we will have two side events which are very intense on challenges and solutions for the Nexus in Spain, and that will be at the end of the day in the evening. And we will have a breakfast on legal issues on the Nexus, which I think promises to be very interesting. There is only a little problem there. It's going to be in Spanish. It will not have translation. It will be downstairs. So I'm sorry about that. 
and uh, then we will have some technical visits that will happen on, on the last day or on the, first, on the Thursday, and you have more information outside. So we will be looking at how partners can collaborate more effectively, so pretty much linking with the kind of issues that Keys has uh, highlighted in his presentation. And uh, we will be looking also at some concrete forms of promoting the partnerships. And in that sense, we will be looking at some funding programs. Uh, there is somebody from the, there's two people who are uh, going to present us through two programs of the European Union to promote public-private partnerships, but also to promote the, the linking of the academia with, uh, with other initiatives. And we will be also looking at establishing so the, the idea of the dialogues. I think the UNECE, who is here, will, will be telling something about that, and also the IUCN about the dialogues they are promoting precisely to, in, to interest governments into incorporating the Nexus approach. So what are the expected outcomes? So we are preparing for World War today, so we'll do, I have taken out a note, uh, Adil, so we'll do as much as we can to provide you with, with those examples, etc. And uh, we will look at partnership generation. We will have the case studies, so we'll do that. We will do some video interviews, and I hope you will be available for that. We have three information briefs out there, and we would like your comments on that, and we will prepare other materials for World War Today. And of course, we would we, we like to, to ensure that you can share knowledge and draw lessons from the existing experience. The co there's something you may think is not important, but it is important. This, this conference has been designed as an open event, so through the webcast and Twitter. We have two people here tweeting all the time what we are saying. An interactive event, you know, through the design of the sessions in an interview style. It is an all-inclusive event, you know, to, so that you be, all of you will be given an opportunity to interact. This is not a question of panelists and audience. The audience is part of the conference and everybody will participate somehow. A learning space and a practical event, so we're really focusing on how we can do things, not just what we know about something. So we are planning to engage all in the, in the conference. We will have overview presentation, providing insights and examples. We will have uh, the panel conveners as facilitators to ensure that we have an animated discussion. We will have panel discussions, sharing and reflecting of what helped in successful experiences, and we also have questions and answers to make sure that we all discuss together. I will have the job of, of reminding us what we have done the day before, so we understand how all this flows during the conference. Um, we will have the side events to, to go in depth into some of the issues. We will have field visits to show inspiring solutions on water and energy. And we have a lot of things that we are doing on communication in this conference. We will have a daily newsletter, okay, so we help us think through. We will webcast, we have Twitter, we have interviews, we have video interviews, we have press conference and press notes, we have press articles and we have a blog where all the other people from the academic community are interacting. I invite you to interact also in the blog if you want, because there's people already discussing there what we have been discussing in here. And so you can help us with that, Kathleen, too. So on the conference website, you can find the information briefs, the summaries of the cases, the interviews, and the reader. And so the, the issue also is that it's not only where we are coming from, but where we are going to. And we heard that we are going to Tokyo pretty soon. We will hear also that we are going to Stockholm, so also important. But um, in the middle, there is a few things going on on the Nexus as well. <laughs> Makes us all very tired. But we have Abu Dhabi next week. We heard from the World Bank. We have a, a, a summit in Delhi. We have a very important Nexus conference in Chapel Hill in USA, where there is going to be like a revival of the, of the Bonn conference. And then we, there will be also things happening after that. There is a, an important event in Quebec, in Canada, not a deal that I think that's going to be important. There is going to be yet another conference in Bonn, on, on also on the Nexus, and one in, in Mexico. Uh, from, you know, IWA, uh, IWA, who is organizing. And finally, after Stockholm, there is also a very important conference in Beijing. So a very, very busy year for you, Adil. 
because I'm sure that with the world water day being on water and energy, all this is going to be important. So, just que we would like to ask you to, to contribute. We have sent you all a lessons learned document. There are some copies out there. Those are, that's more or less the basis for the, for the conclusions of the conference. I invite you all to, to, to input into that. To, because we are trying to illustrate that with examples, so any of your experience, please you know, put it in. We would like to provide you comments on the information briefs, ideas for the World Water Day, or Adil has already asked very, very clear questions, and also hopefully for World Water Week. I hope it's not all closed, that it's still open, and also to use this opportunity to engage. So that's all from me. I hope you have a very good Two days coming ahead, there's plenty of experiences and I'm sure you are all going to be very interested and hopefully you will take home some practical ways of improving partnerships. Thank you very much. We have now, tomorrow we start at 9.30. Let me just see, I have a few notes here in terms of, um, I don't know where I left it, but I, mean, I think I remember. We have um, uh, today at 7.30. The, the municipality is inviting us to go there. The mayor will be receiving us. I think we'll have a little music and a little food too. And it's at 7.30. If you don't know where it is, the municipality, I'm sure your hotels will be able to tell you, but otherwise, you know, you can ask in reception. It's in the Plaza del Pilar. So that seems to be, it's at 7.30, yes? Yes, well, next, next to it, yes, yeah, next to it. And we will start tomorrow at 9.30 with a recap presentation. So thank you very much, and that's all from today. Thank you.